Welcome to Mitchell County, City of Camilla, and the Comprehensive Tax. What? Now I'm off. I can talk loud enough without it. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to uh, the Joe B. Adams Conference Center here in Camilla. We're going to have a tax uh, reform study, comprehensive tax reform study committee meeting here today. Uh, we have a couple of individuals here that want to welcome you to Camilla. I'm going to call on Chairman of the Mitchell County Board of Commissioners, Mr. Benjamin Haywood. Ben, please step up to the microphone now. Thanks, sir. I would like to welcome the members of the House Comprehensive Tax Study Committee in attendance here today. We have members from the ACCG, GMA, and the Georgia School Board. Association. And we'd like to say on behalf of Mitchell County and the sisters of Mitchell County that we really welcome you here and glad that you came down to Mitchell County to have your first meeting. I know that most of y'all that live north of Atlanta and west of Atlanta thought that when you got to the airport y'all was in South Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> but you're really in South Georgia. <laughs> and just remember one thing in the tax study that we all represent the same peoples and there in it's no two cities and no two counties the same size. What affect one county won't necessarily affect the other county. But please remember us and give us all the release and all the help that you can give us from Atlanta because we need some help. We represent that part of the government where we say for the rubber meet the road, we get to see the citizens every day. We meet them at the post office, at the grocery stores, and they ask them for relief other than tax relief. So is there anything that you can do to help us in this study, please help us. We'd like to welcome you to Mitchell County. And we had a representative once that every time he passed a bill, he would always ask the governor to send something below the net line. And the governor asked him one day, where's the net line? He said, well, where the money stopped. <laughs> so we want to move the net line down to Florida. So please send some help to Mitchell County. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I've had some people ask me today what these little things are flying around. And you can tell they've been in Atlanta too long. <laughs> We'd like to have Mayor Jay Powell, City of Camilla, to come up now and say a few words. I want to just echo what Ben said and uh, welcome all of you, not only members of the committee, but members of the audience and the presenters to Camilla. We hope you enjoy your stay here and uh, hope that this represents an effort by all of us to find out what's happening all over the state, not just in particular parts of the state, and that as Ben said, things that affect one part may not necessarily affect others, and we just we appreciate the fact that y'all are interested in us, interested in our particular situations and revenue situations and expenses, and uh, thank you for being here. Hope you enjoy your stay, and welcome to Camilla. Thank you, Jay. We have one other gentleman. We have Harris Morgan standing in the doorway. Harris owns this facility. He has spent quite a made quite of an investment next door in the, the McCree Hall and this conference committee, and he wanted to add his welcome to you as well. I want to tell you we appreciate y'all being here, and I want to tell you just a few things about the McCree Hall. The McCree Hall was built in 1906, and it took us about four years to restore it back to what it is today. And it is actually sort of a museum. Uh, my wife, this is a labor of love of my wife, and she put it back basically like it is. The only thing that's not original to the house is the four bedrooms upstairs. They all have king-size beds in them. The rest of it is all original. There are papers that document back to the uh, 1840s where people from Albany were writing down here talking to Mr. McCree saying that they wanted to buy land. And we've got a land-grant deed that's on the wall is, that was put there that was uh, given back when the, uh, the capital of Georgia was in Milledgeville. So, I mean, this thing is really, this is an old place, and it takes, uh, it took, we think, six generations of Mr. McCree's family to spend all of his money. So we had to turn around and redo what, what they did. But anyway, we want to welcome you to Camilla, and if y'all have a break, if they give you a break, y'all take a tour of the house and look at it. It's pretty beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Harris. We've got a large agenda today, and I, I'm going to tell you what our charge is in just a moment, but I think it's at the time that we ought to introduce the members of the committee. I'm Richard Royal. I represent Mitchell County, the city of Camilla, and the city of Pelham. I can't ever uh, leave that out because there's too much rivalry between the two. Things. 
Okay, so much for that. Uh, I'm Richard Royal. I've been in the legislature 23 years. Uh, Chairman O'Neill allowed me. To, Chairman O'Neill allowed me to host this committee down here. It's an important uh, committee. We've uh, got a lot of work to do. Um, let me say one thing. You see all these other mics. So this is being taped uh, to be on the internet starting tomorrow, Brent. This will be available on the internet on the, on the Georgia uh, le legis.ga.gov. You can see this meeting in its entirety over the internet beginning tomorrow. So uh, all of these tax meetings will be taped and, and available for that for those who could not attend. Uh, having said that, I'm going to introduce Representative Larry O'Neill. He's chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And tell him where you're from and uh, anything else you'd like to there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Larry O'Neill from uh, Warner Robins, uh, Georgia, Houston County, actually. Uh, Bonaire, Warner Robins area, Perry. They're all part of the uh, area that I represent there. And uh, just delighted to be here in Camilla, Georgia, in Mitchell County with uh, with my good friend uh, Richard Richard Royal, chairing our committee, and looking forward to learning a lot today. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. My name is Chuck Martin. I represent North Fulton, uh, above Atlanta, Alfreda, Roswell, and we call it Greater North Fulton. Um, next Tuesday, we may birth two more cities up there, Johns Creek and, and Milton. Uh, but I've had the um, fortune of, of serving in the legislature, legislature with these, uh, my, my colleagues, my ladies and gentlemen, friends uh, from around the state of Georgia for four years. And prior to that was uh, in local government as city council member and mayor uh, for 10 years. So. Mr. Chairman, I, I know what you mean. Y'all you, have, have a tough job out there, and we'll, we'll endure to uh, listen to what you have to say and try to make uh, things better for Georgia. Thank you for hosting us down here, and thank you all for taking your time to come uh, to, this, to this meeting. Uh, I'm Butch Parrish. I'm from Swainsboro. It's up in Manuel County. This is my 22nd year in the uh, House, and I appreciate the fact that our chairman is willing for us to have these meetings and move them around the state and not have them just in the Atlanta area. I think that's important. We were able to come out and listen to you out here and see what the concerns are around the state. So I'm glad to be here. And thank you all for coming. My name is James Mills. Uh, I've been in the legislature for 14 years. I chair the Banks and Banking Committee, and it's an honor to be here uh, with you today. Uh, my grandparents on both sides are from Grady County, just down the road. So while I'm from North Georgia and represent Lake Lanier area and Hall County, I have roots from uh, down here as well, so it's, it's good to be here today. My name is David Knight. I am uh, the representative from House District 126. Uh, that's Griffin, Georgia. That's about an hour below Atlanta, and I, I have Spalding County, Lamar County, and Butts County. And um, it is a pleasure to be back down here. I actually uh, lived in, uh, in Baker County for about three and a half years while I worked in Albany, so it's good to be back uh, Back down here, Richard. I didn't forget my way back. <laughs> Hello, my name is Steve Tillman. I'm from Marietta, Cock County, and I'm delighted to be down here with Camilla. Like as others have said, this is it's great to get out and see other parts of the state and you know, know where all our bills go or don't go. But in two weeks, we're going to have the next session in Marietta, and I'd like to ask each and one of you to come up. We have it won't be as pretty as this facility, but it's Southern uh, Polytech. Uh, Right off I 75, but we'll give you the same uh, hospitality, but everything but the next. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's all of our House members here. Now we have uh, Senator Mitch Seaball, Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, has brought uh, members of the Senate Committee down here <coughs> to join us today. And I'll introduce Senator Seaball and let him introduce his panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to me, respectfully, Chairman Royal. We've got the opportunity to work with him again. Again, my name is Mitch Seaball, and I'm from Sharpsburg, Georgia, um, which probably <clears throat> you're a little more familiar with the town called Noon uh, or Moreland. i from that area. And I represent Coweta County, Carroll County, Heard County, and part of Troop County. I, as I said, I chair the Senate Finance Committee. I'm also the majority whip in the Senate. And I'm the chairing the Senate side of this and look forward to being here. And I want to thank you so much for the hospitality. I had a great lunch here. Um, just a minute ago, so um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, good and interesting presentations, so I won't fall asleep after that great lunch, but I'll let my other members of the committee introduce themselves, beginning with Senator Bill Heath. I'm Bill Heath. I represent Senate District 31, which runs from uh, I-20 west of Atlanta around uh, I-75 on the north side, and uh, 
Pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Senator Seth Harp. I represent the 29th District. I'm Chairman of Higher Education in the Senate and on Appropriations, Judiciary, and other committees. Uh, I have a confession to make. Uh, I'm down here in Camilla today, and uh, actually I committed a heinous crime down here 37 years ago. I stole my wife from Camilla. <laughs> uh, this is a homecoming. Uh, Joe Adams, Joe Adams, I used to sit right by Mr. Joe when we were in church at First Baptist Church, and I got married there July 26th, 1969. So this is a homecoming. Glad to be down here in Camilla. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Goggins, and I represent Senate District 7, which includes uh, 10 counties here in South Georgia. I'm George Hooks from America, so I uh, have been in the legislature 26 years, finishing my 26th year in December. And uh, I represent 16 counties and 37 counties. I have more mayors than any state legislator and more county commissioners than any state legislator in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to working with y'all. Any <laughs> old friends and get to be my colleagues today. Look forward to wearing all. We're glad to have all of you here. We got we have two other individuals I'd like to recognize. Ward Lamb to my immediate left is the House Policy Analyst for, for the House of Representatives, and we have Brian Johnson from Senate Research. They'll be helping us as we go through these meetings and help us assimilate all the papers. Uh, does anyone else have anything before we begin this meeting? I hope not. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the background, uh, how this study committee was created. House Resolution 1464 was introduced by Ways and Means Chairman Larry O'Neill this past year in, in January and, and created the study committee. The Comprehensive Tax Reform Study Committee was needed because the populations and economy of the state of Georgia have undergone dynamic growth in the last several years. The reliance on traditional tax revenue sources, when coupled with a rapid increase in demand for services and the demand for tax relief, has yielded a strained revenue structure unable to respond to current and future fiscal needs in a balanced, equitable fashion and has increasingly troubled and burdened financially the individual taxpayers of this state. Over the years, the revenue structure of Georgia, like that of many other states, has received only sporadic piecemeal revision, and these changes too frequently have been made in an isolated context without due regard to the overall tax system. It was determined that a careful and comprehensive study should be undertaken to determine how best to modernize and revitalize the revenue structure so as to create an equitable and flexible tax system for Georgia. And we want to emphasize the equitable side of that. In 20 years of service on the Ways and Means Committee, I know that any time that you amend the revenue code, uh, I don't know if this is the way we should put it, but somebody gets gored. Any tax legislation that we pass usually results in a tax shift from one taxable class of taxpayers to another. So we have to be careful in our analysis of all of our tax code because we don't want to have what our chairman quite often refers to as, as, as uh, unintended consequences in our tax code. Uh, at our first meeting in Atlanta that we had here several weeks ago, we had ACCG, GMA, uh, Express the concerns of the local county and city governments. We had the, the school board association express concerns for the, the local school boards across Georgia. We had individuals, both corporate and individual taxpayers, express their concern. This meeting today is going to primarily be a meeting of discovery. We're going to look at the revenue stream or revenue sources, resources of all the city governments, the county governments, the boards of education, and the state of Georgia. Before we can make any type of... Uh, uh, intelligent decision about what we should do. We've got to identify all the sources of revenue, what the impacts would be if we change those, and to make a, 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 an intelligent decision on what we should do for the tax code. Again, we uh, want to express our ideas that whatever we do, we want it to be equitable. We don't want to have un unintended consequences, and uh, uh, we want to want to make sure the citizens of the state of Georgia are treated fairly. Uh, one note that I might tell you on cell phones, I have this terrible thing about cell phones going off in a meeting. If you have one, please put it on vibrate. I'm not going to tell you to cut it off, but put it on vibrate. 
Uh, having said that, I'm going to turn to the committee over to Ways and Means Chairman, Mr. Larry O'Neill, to make any statements he'd like to make. <coughs> well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and that concludes my prepared statements. Because <laughs> as you can, you can probably see from this beautiful surroundings and the agenda and Mr. Chairman Royal's opening uh, remarks, uh, he's, uh, he's totally in charge of everything you're going to hear and learn today, uh, has made all the arrangements for this, and has really walked the extra 50 miles, really not just the mile, to, to make this what will probably be one of our most successful, if not our most successful undertakings in this in this study. And, it, and uh, I would just like to remind everybody uh, that, again, as Chairman Royal stated, uh, equity is is uh, uh, is the byline for, for for this committee. We're we're not seeking uh, to to uh, to justify any particular agenda that we have going into this, I've asked this committee and our colleagues in the Senate to, to come with a totally clear mind for a comprehensive study of effect and affect of our tax code. And uh, we're going to try to get around the entire state of Georgia and hear from all the, all the stakeholders. And uh, as the chairman of the committee back in Atlanta, not the one here because that's Chairman Royal, but back in Atlanta, I want to express our appreciation to Chairman Royal for all he's done for this uh, meeting and the organization and everything, meant much time and effort's gone into it. <clears throat> but really, all he's done for the state and the constituents that he represents now for 20 some odd years. And uh, uh, also, as the chairman of Ways and Means and other committees, as he has uh, served his uh, his constituents so loyally in the in the Georgia House. So we we appreciate uh, you and your efforts, and uh, we especially appreciate being in your home turf here, Mr. Chairman. So I'm looking forward to the agenda you got set for us and what we're going to hear and learn. Thank you. Senator Seabaugh, would you like to make any comments before we get started? Well, I'd like to echo Chairman Mills' comments and appreciation to uh, you. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people here have a good understanding of the wealth of knowledge that we have sitting up at this table, um, especially amongst Chairman Royal and, and Chairman Hooks. Uh, wealth of knowledge to go to this. So we ought to learn, many of us should learn a lot from uh, all that y'all have. And uh, let's get to work. Okay. Uh, for the members of the panel up here, the, the House and Senate members, uh, we would ask that you let Ward or Brian, if we recognize you for questions, help us keep up with those. Uh, uh, we're going to have to move right along, and as you have questions, uh, let, let one of them know, and, and then I'll call on you for, for your questions. Our first presenter is going to be Shea Hester. Uh, she's with the Department of Revenue. I've known Shea for many years. She is a... Uh, she started out, as I met her, with the with the property tax division, and now Shay, what is your title now? Director of the Local Capital Services Division. Okay, Shay, would you come forward and present to have your presentation, please? Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. As a matter of fact, you're talking about the bed and breakfast. We checked into the bed and breakfast earlier today. And uh, there were two of us. And so the girl said, well, come on upstairs and pick out your room. So we went upstairs and looked through all the bedrooms and decided which one we wanted. And then when we came down, there was uh, nothing. You didn't have to sign in. You know, you didn't have to. They had already taken our credit card and everything. And they said, what time would you like breakfast in the morning? I said, oh, I don't know. About, maybe 7.30 would be fine. But it was so nice, it was so relaxed, but it sure is hot here. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, uh, my husband's from South Georgia, by the way, and I am not from Georgia. I'm from South Carolina originally, and he and we've been married quite a number of years. And he's, I still can't get used to the South Georgia weather. And he, we, every year we go to his family reunion, and I'm just, you know, doing this. And he said, you just don't know how to do it, do you? And I said, no, I've never learned about that. But it's good to be here. Um... Chairman Royal had asked uh, about uh, revenue sources. And so being from the state, I thought we'd give him some state revenue sources. All of the information, and we've got it here on the screen, is published on the DOR website under the 2005 uh, statistical report. And the one on the website has three years, three fiscal years, so uh, the most recent fiscal year being uh, 2005. So I have given a handout to all the members, but the audience can follow along here. Uh, I do want to caution the members that I am pretty well versed in property tax 
And I know a little bit about sales tax distribution since our division took on that responsibility. But if you have any questions about a lot of this, uh, I must defer those to our deputy commissioner, Mr. Ed Maney, who showed up, thank goodness. So he's in the audience. If you Ed, can. stand up a second. Let him see what a deputy commissioner looks like. <laughs> <laughs> he's shorter than the right. real one. <laughs> yes, he's a little thank shorter you, than, the, than our commissioner. It's all guys down here. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Just kidding, if you see this, Barton. <laughs> the auto is starting to But uh, the, the list itself uh, talks, uh, the, the first item, of course, is, uh, I can't read that, selective sales tax, which includes motor fuel, and uh, all, uh, also that includes mileage tax, uh, and all the various tobacco, liquor, beer, and wine taxes. I'm not going to go over the amounts. I don't know that that's material right now. I think that you're just looking for the sources. And then we have the general sales and use taxes, and that does include the motor fuel sales tax. And, and let me do, uh, let me go back and tell you that the selective sales tax motor fuel does include the IFTA tax as well. That's the uh, the international fuel tax agreement. <coughs> The personal income tax, I don't think that is, uh, I mean, that's pretty well cut and dry. Everybody knows they pay the personal income tax or individual income tax. And there's no subsource for that revenue. Corporate income tax and license tax, that includes under the subsource financial institution occupation tax, net worth tax, and of course corporate income tax. You'll see the motor vehicle fees on um, that's blank right now, and of course, motor vehicle just came back. Tax and titles just came back to the department last July, so I don't have any figures on that. I did call our motor vehicle division, and uh, they weren't able to give me anything by the time uh, or to in time to prepare for the meeting. So I don't have that, but I think we can get that for you at a later time if you need the, if you need the actual funds. And then we have property tax, which includes general property, which is real and personal property. Um, PSC fees or public service commission fees. You know, we do collect the PSC fees. We have the intangible recording tax, and then, of course, interest and other. There is also a motor, excuse me, a, a motor carrier tax, which is, and you'll see that that is a negative number, and that's because that's the amount of collections that are distributed back from the IFTA, I believe, and if I'm wrong, you help me with this. We collect the IFTA tax from everyone buying fuel in Georgia and then refund other states. Is that right? Oh, so it's based on the mileage, travel mileage. Based on the travel mileage. So there is a... Uh, there is a negative there because that is refunded amounts. And then there's decal citation and temporary permit fees. Then we have lumped all the other taxes. And this one, the one on the website does not, yes it does, it lists those separately. We have the coin operated <coughs> amusement machines, the liquor dealer's license, the beer and wine dealer's license, the tobacco dealer's license, and then we have some training funds, the unclaimed property, the state children's trust fund, the local sales 1% collection fee that the state collects for administering the tax and distributing the tax, and then all others, which uh, includes other commissions and collecting and assessing fees. Have any questions concerning anything we've, we've listed or need to know anything further about it? Mr. O'Neill has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, in general, if you could, Ms. Hester, I'd, I'd really like uh, to know, at least for myself, how each of these taxes that you've listed here are computed. I mean, it, obviously, sales tax is a percentage of the, 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 the price, uh, especially in the other tax category. I noticed, too, I remember we did the indigent defense fund, and those were several fees that, that, that I think are 
our clerks and courts and everything deal with, would you not consider that a state tax since it come it's, it, it came out of the the, the state law? Would, would it be interested in your comments on that uh, and how each of these are are computed and how one might affect the other, or how the economy might affect the computation and whatever your views on those matters might be. All right, uh, and Ed, do you know anything about the indigent defense fund? I don't. I think a lot of this we may have to get back to it another time. We don't collect taxes. Pardon me. We don't collect that. I mean, we don't account for that. That's that's not on this. Okay. But is it something that we have available to get? I'm sure. Would you please get that for yes, us? Sure. Thank you. Sure. What about that? If she could just briefly cover how the each each tax is computed. You understand what he's asking, Chad? All right, yeah, Ed, you probably don't have to come up and help me with some of this, too. Like I say, I know property tax, and I know a little bit about sales tax distributions, but Ed's probably going to have to help us with that. You know, of course, I can tell you about property tax. It's based upon the assessed value of your property or the fair market value of your property times 40% times a millage levy by each taxing authority. And, of course, it's based upon the worth of your property. It's collected at the local level. It's uh, the, the tax commissioner of each county or the, or the tax collector in the cities would collect that tax. They would also they would collect the county, school, state, and they may, uh, the county tax commissioner, if contracted with the city, would collect the city's portion. But even though they collect all the taxes, they do remit the state's portion to us on a monthly basis, and we pay them commissions to do so. Chairman, members of the committees, and members of the Senate Finance, and other interested folks, uh, motor fuel tax, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, a set rate per gallon. It's a seven and a half cents excise tax per gallon, and a three percent tax, if you will, like a sales tax. A lot of a lot of folks think to think it's a sales tax, but it's all devoted to the Department of Transportation. It's all dedicated to fund source. There's also a 1% tax that goes on that motor fuel that goes into the general fund. And that's why you see the separation of it when you get down to the general sales and use tax, which is at the state rate of 4%, also includes this, what they call the, the motor, extra 1% motor fuel tax. The tobacco tax, uh, for example, is a set price per pack of cigarettes or a set price uh, for cigars and or other tobacco. Liquor is the same way. It's, it's based on wine gallons, liquor, beer, and wine. You know, it's a set rate per those gallons. Uh, the corporate income tax uh, has only one rate that's down in the corporate income and license tax area. And the personal income tax has a top rate of 6%. The corporate income tax has a 6% rate. The net worth tax is based on capital here in Georgia. And it's a minimum of $10 and a maximum of $5,000. The financial institution tax is not very big because folks get credits for that, I believe. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, exactly what that rate is, but it's, a, it's like a gross receipts tax. But it's a small amount. Um, the counties also get part of, not part of that particular amount, but they also have something at the local level. Uh, Shay has to talk to you about the property tax. The motor carrier tax, which is a negative, again, a lot of trucking companies buy their fuel in Georgia and then travel to other states, and those are our distributions of the motor fuel taxes collected here at the pump and refunded uh, based on mileage to the other states that are in what I call a, a nationwide compact. Down in the other taxes and fees, I, I, we can get you the exact uh, numbers, Mr. Chairman, but coin-operated music machines is, is, is a set amount per machine and the liquor dealer and beer and wine license, there's, there's set amounts. I just don't have to have those off hands. Same with the tobacco dealer licenses. And unclaimed property, of course, is the, the property that is sheeted to the state uh, by the holders of that property in the state. And the rest is, has a, I think that's it on the taxes. Any questions? In terms of, of uh, would you repeat your question about, I think you asked if one would affect the other? If, well, if it, uh, I, was, I was interested if you had any particular comments of the interrelationship of the two, but let me add to that, too. One of the goals of this entire committee and, and research forum that we're con conducting is to 
is to have a comprehensive <coughs> explanation of every revenue resource in the state. Dr. Ledbetter is with us somewhere in the audience that does our, our How to Be a Legislator course every two years in, uh, in Athens, which is probably as good as there is in any state in this in the country. And we were going to use a lot of the data collected here for newly elected legislators when they come in or they'll have an idea at the state, the county, and the city, and the school board level what revenue resources they're going to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis so that they'll be able to be uh, productive for their constituents sooner it take, and, and maybe cut down on the time of the learning curve. So we're asking you to sort of act yes. like a college professor instead of a instead of a deputy commissioner and just give us the... the, the, the As a college on. professor, what I will do is make available the, the publication that's already printed by the state for tax <laughs> which gives all those rates. I mean, it's a public uh, guide that's given out every year to anybody that wants the citizens of the state okay. to explain the rates for every one of these taxes and how they're going to be computed. All right, good. So we'll make those available. They're already pre-printed. Ed, would you go into a little more detail on the unclaimed property tax, how that uh, uh, comes to the state, how long it's held, and... and, and Since Shea administers it, I'll let her okay. the details. It isn't really a tax as such, but anyone that has funds, let's say they could be uh, salary checks that haven't been claimed, it could even be any kind of insurance payments, Anything that is owed to an individual or an entity of any kind that has not been claimed, and these companies that are holding unclaimed funds have made uh, made the best due diligence they can to find these people who the, the money belongs to. Within a certain uh, period of time, if they're not found, then the money is sent to the state. Now, it's, it's not a tax. It's not, it's not set on a set rate or anything like that. It's just whatever the holder is holding and has not been claimed. It could even be tangible property, such as the only tangible property, of course, would be safe deposit box contents. If someone had not paid their safe deposit box fee, within a given period of time, the bank would drill the box. They would hold those contents for a period of time, and if the, the holder or the owner was not found, they would actually send the same deposit box contents to the state. We hold those forever. The money goes to the state treasury. Uh, it's put into uh, the unclaimed property account. It is held there, and it is can be claimed by the rightful owner or heirs forever. There's no statute on how long it, uh, someone has to claim it. Senator Seaball has a question. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Well, do we have any information on I'm the best I can try to explain this, but if, if there's any relationship between sales tax and, and, and personal and then corporate income tax, that if, let's say that our, we saw our personal income tax would go up by 10%, would, is there any way that we could gain any kind of knowledge of what we could expect in any one of the other two areas? Or if they were to go down? Do you understand the question I'm asking? How does one relate to the other if, if one, how does one affect well, the if, other? Well, as the economy runs, if, you, if, if we would see, expect a 4% growth in our economy, would it affect those three areas the same? Or do we have any knowledge that would give us that certain ones would grow faster than another one? If we saw a downturn in the economy, what would we expect in any one of those categories? I'm not sure we've done anything like that. Do you need to be Senator Seaball, the department does not do the, does not have an economist on staff that does not do those estimates. Uh, Georgia State, uh, specifically, Ken Hagney does those estimates uh, for the governor. Well, I'm, and not, the I'm, state. Not speaking, I'm not speaking as, uh, No, but I don't know estimates. the answer of how much. I, I think generally if, if income goes up by 10%, I think you, uh, to the extent that there's some disposable income left, this, this, the sales tax revenues should grow, but not necessarily by 10%. Some of that would go into savings, and some of that would be spent. Are we aware of anybody that has any knowledge of that, or the department does not? I mean, I'm just looking at these two years here. That basically our our sales tax grew by 8.4 percent from one to the next year, but personal income tax grew only by 5.6, and then corporate was grew by 51 percent. Cor corporate, I'd like to keep out of the mix. <laughs> Thank you. Cor but, but the answer to your question, I think as one grows, the other will grow, but not necessarily by as much. Any other members have a question? Mr. Chair. Mr. Mills. 
I had one question on the very bottom of the uh, summary there. Where it says other commissions for collecting and assessing. That's a pretty large drop from 04 to 05, uh, from 76.45 to 16.71. Is uh, what is the reason for that? Do you know? I, I think I, I checked with the person who does this statistical report, but and I tried to get the answer to that. I have not been able to get him yet. He's not, he wasn't available at the time, but I will definitely get that for you. Mr. Tumlin. For fiscal year 06, I know you probably don't have the detail, but it was 14.7 for 05. Do you have an idea what it was for this year? For June 30th, 06? It's up through uh, May, it was up 9% over the prior year. I think around 9%, 8.9, as I recall. Shay, I'd like to go down to the property tax session down at the, the special assessment program. Am I reading this right, that there was a, the tax shift involved in conservation use was $149 million? That was for the year 05? Yes, sir. That was for tax year 2005. That, that was, the, those, it says a shift, and that's what it was. It, it took the property tax off of those in conservation use, and then through millages or increases in millages and everything, it was shifted to the rest of the... Yes, sir. And behind you, I, I pulled up the annual report that we send the legislature every year uh, on the screen here. And uh, I didn't have it available. I didn't realize we, we might need that. But uh, since it's here, you can track it through the years. If you look here behind you, I'm sorry, y'all have to turn around for this. But we call it conservation use revenue loss, but that is a misnomer. It really isn't a revenue loss. It's a revenue shift. You know, anytime you grant an exemption, uh, you're, all you're doing is shifting the burden from one taxpayer to another. So you can see from 1997, of course, the conservation use program has been in effect since 1992. So we still have five previous years, so I'm not showing on this graph. But the revenue shift uh, was 30, uh, let's say 32 million in 1997, and uh, 2004 it went up to 127.3 million. And of course, as uh, Chairman Roy has just talked about now, it's at 149.3 million. So those, it's growing. those that have properties in that would say it was a tax saving. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> it is a tax savings for some. Okay. Any other questions, members of the committee? We appreciate your uh, presentation, and uh, we we'll look forward to receiving those other uh, sources and information that have been asked for. Our next presenter is Clint Mueller, Legislative Director for ACCG, our County Governments Association. Clint, where are you? There I'm you are. Okay. It affects us. It affects you one way or another. It affects me as a problem. Thank you, Chairman Roll, members of the committee. We appreciate you inviting the county commissioners to share with you today a little bit about where our revenues come from and what we use those revenues for. I've got a presentation that I'm putting up on the screen behind you, but you've got the same presentation in, in your notebook. Let me just real quickly explain what's in your notebook there. In the uh, left-hand pocket, you've got a copy of our property tax video. This is about an 11-minute video, and it sort of explains um, how property taxes are collected, what we use property tax revenues for, what's the appeals process, all this about. It's, it's, it was designed really for commissioners to use for their constituents to help people understand the property tax system. So we encourage you to take a look at that video in your, in your spare time. We also have a copy of the video on our website. In the uh, right-hand pocket, I, in addition to the copy of the presentation, you've got two other documents there. This is a pretty extensive list of all our revenues and our expenditures. Everything that, every, all the revenue sources the counties have should be on this list. This, is, this came out of the Uniform Card of Accounts, which um, a, a group of stakeholders statewide put together, and it's, it's for accounting systems, and it, and it tells counties how to classify their revenues and expenditures. But, it gives you a little brief explanation about the revenue, uh, the code section in the law that authorizes the revenue source, 
And then I, I wanted to include the expenditure sheet too because it's always important to look at expenditures and know what we're spending the money on. So that gives you an idea about what we spend those revenues on. So that's just something for you to take with you. Obviously, you know, I've been asked to speak for about 20 minutes here and in a 20 minute presentation, I'm not gonna be able to review every revenue source on that sheet. I'd like to. And I'd be glad if y'all have any questions to answer any specific questions about any specific revenue source. But I'm going to hit the major ones. Uh, when you get into fees, we've got hundreds of little fees out there, especially when you get into the court fees and constitutional officer fees. There's no way I'm going to be able to go through all those. And I know in the first meeting, y'all asked us to bring a list of all the constitutional officer's fees, and we're putting that together. And I think we're supposed to present that at the very last meeting, and we'll do that. Um, before I get started, too, I'd like to, to thank, we've got several of our county commissioners that are in the audience today. In fact, we have one of our commissioners that drove all the way from Dade County. You all know where Dade County is. That's about as far away as you can get from here. It's still stay in Georgia. So we really appreciate their interest in taking the time out of their schedule to come down here and be with you all. And, and being down here for me is like going home because I grew up about 40 miles west of here in a little town called Blakely, Georgia. So I'm real familiar with the gnats and the heat. The uh, data that you're going to see in our presentation um, has come from the DCA, most of it's come from the DCA finance survey. Uh, most of it's 2004 data, and there was all but two counties that had reported their data. So 157 of the 159 counties had reported data for that survey. That's just to, to let you know where most of this data that's behind these charts that you're going to see has come from. Uh, on and this slide just shows the, uh, the different people that we work with in putting this presentation together, the Department of Revenue, Department of Community Affairs, Carl Benson Institute of Government, the Warnell School of Forestry Resources at the University of Georgia, and others. Let's uh, go ahead and start <coughs> on page four, county government revenues. These are the broad, county, uh, broad categories that we derive our revenues from. You go ahead and switch, uh, turn over to page five. You have a pie chart. You can see it easier on the screen. I apologize. It's sort of small uh, on your on your handout, and it's not in color on your handout. But I wanted you to sort of get an idea about statewide where 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 are we deriving our major sources of revenue from, and how much of our budget do these revenue sources make up? Um, and again, I want to say this is statewide data. This is going to vary greatly from county to county. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to show you some examples of, of county, individual county data and compare it back to this statewide slide. But on average, using all the, the data from across the state, about 38% of our revenues are coming from property tax, 22% from sales tax. Uh, that other revenue category, that's a pretty big category, 10%. What that, what that really composes is all these little fees, the, the court fees, the, um, if somebody mentioned uh, some of, uh, well, engine defense, which we pay for part of the engine defense, and those come from some, some of the court fees, as well as the constitutional officer fees, those are all lumped together in that other revenue. Like I say, there's hundreds of those. Uh, utilities, later on in the presentation, I'll, I'll show you how many counties actually have utilities, but that 13% of the pie, um, there's only about 50 something counties that actually have utilities, so a lot of counties don't have that piece of the pie in their revenue makeup. Um, and I'm going to explain in more detail what is in these larger categories, the breakdown of the things that make up these larger categories. Service fees, that's like charges for services, uh, grants, license permits and regulatory fees, and then excise and special use taxes. Uh, so that's just to give you a sense of um, how much we rely on each one of these revenue sources. Let's go ahead and talk about property tax. I'm probably going to spend just a little bit longer on property tax since that's our major revenue source. This is the components of the property tax. This is one way to look at it. Uh, obviously, most it's real and personal, but in addition to the real and personal property, uh, we get some other fees. This is breaking out how the, um, the finance survey breaks it out. So, you know, motor vehicles, for instance, is 9% of our property tax revenues on average. Um, and I know that y'all have been interested in, in, in motor vehicle taxes. There's another study for me that's looking at that this year. Uh, utilities, 3%. Um, and then 
the real person, we try to break that up to give you a sense of how much of that's real and how much of that's personal, and we were not able to get that data. We're still working on it. It's going to take some time because it does not exist, but we're having to pull that data from individual county sheets to try to, to give you a sense of how much of, of that large piece of the pie is personal versus real property. Uh, page 7, again, just to give you a sense of, of the property tax and where it's going. Schools are getting about 57% of it. Counties are getting about 29% of it. Uh, and then uh, cities get about, and, and, uh, and the, there's a few authorities that get the uh, other 13 something percent of it. Of course, the state gets less than 1% of the property tax. So we're the second heaviest user of the property tax revenue. On page A, I wanted to give you an idea about how the uh, or excuse me, the, uh, the distribution of burden and paying the property tax is shifted among various classes of property. And we've got several classes. We've got timber, mobile homes, ag, utility, industrial, motor vehicle, commercial, and residential. And as you can see over time, the um, residential is picking up more of the share of that piece of the pie. Uh, back in 1997, residential, um, well, from 1997 to 2004, residential picked up 8%. It went from 44.1% in 97 to 52.3% of the pie in 2004. Uh, utilities have gone down. Industrials have gone down. Motor vehicles have gone down. Commercial has gone down. Most of the rest of the categories have gone down. Um, ag and timber have also gone down. So, but this slide really, I guess, highlights the fact that most of that property tax burden is growing in the residential component of our property tax digest. Why it's shrinking on the other. Now, if you look at raw dollars, raw dollars is increasing on everybody. Everybody's is the the, uh, the amount that everybody's paying is going up. But you can see it's going up much faster for the residential. So they're they're consuming a larger piece of that. Pie. You take a whole pot of property taxes and who's paying how much of that pot, it's, it's mostly residential and that's growing. Now that may not be a bad thing. <laughs> um, changes in, 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 on the next page, page nine, Richard. shows the changes in, in uh, Georgia property tax levy. Clint, yes. we have a question here, Senator Tahir. Let, let me be sure I understand on, the, I guess it was the previous slide there. Right. These increases are in rates, not dollars, then. No, no, no. this is, it, this it, is it, looking at the whole piece. It's not really looking at the increase in revenues. It's looking at the whole pot of money and how that pot of money is distributed, how the, how the burden is placed on different um, property tax payers or classes of property tax payers. So for 2004, if we added up all of those columns there, we'd come up with 100%. That, that's right. Well... Well, would, would you say the same for 97? In the, in the percentage, you don't, yeah. If you were to add up all the percentages for timber, motor vehicle, ag, yeah, utility, industrial, it all, it all add to 100%. Yes. But we don't show all those percentages on here. You, well, you see the lines to the left, but you'd have to kind of guess the exact percentage. You see, if you look at the very bottom ones, timber and, and mobile homes, they look like they're almost zeros. Um, when they're they're really, I think uh, timber's like point something percent. Okay. This is this is this is not talking about the escalation in, in the amount of dollars paid or the revenues paid. We're just talking about of, of, the, of all the property taxes collected in the state, who's paying the sh what share of that piece of the pie, and more of that burden is going on to residential, and less is is, is on these other um, classes. Yes. Representative Martin has a question. I'm follow up with that, and again, um, I think everybody's concerned with you know the residential taxpayer as well as the, the commercial taxpayer. Is there any analysis, or has any analysis been done to attribute that? I mean, more people live in Georgia relative to the tax to, to the property right. tax than they, they did even 10 years ago because there's more residential construction. I mean, we only have so much land in Georgia, oh. but there's more, more land that was in agriculture is is, is now in residential is. Is that that's not accounted at all. This is just raw numbers cutting up the pie by percentage. You're not taking into account that there are more residential 
Well, that's I'm, I'm sure like that's it. what's driving the residential piece of that pie getting larger is because of, we're a high growth state. We've got a lot of people moving in. At the same time, there's farmers that are getting out of the farming business. There's industrials that are leaving our state. Uh, so we're losing that part of our digest, or, or that part of the digest, excuse me, is not growing as rapidly as the residential component. So I, I'm, I agree. But I think that my only question is this, this is just raw data. This is, you haven't factored any analysis as to there's more residential, less, less farmers. It's just raw that's data. Right. Okay. That's right. That's just showing the total pot of revenue we get and how much of it's coming from what source. Senator Seaball has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Plant. So, but basically, more property going into residential being taxed that is, is helping to contribute that, but also increased assessments have gotten that number too. Is that not correct? Well, then the increased assessments would apply to everybody. I mean, every, when assessments go up, everybody gets the increase in the assessments. In fact, homeowners sometimes have some protections, like a few of our counties that have these floating homestead exemptions, they actually get some protections that help limit the effect on them, where the commercial properties and the ag and timber and others don't get that protection, so they would actually get more of a shift and feel more of the burden when assessments go up. Well, so, it ain't, ain't happening in my county. I can tell you that right now, because that is a huge, huge issue, mm -hmm. is the, the, the accelerated rate that assessments are going up, which is driving the property tax that they're paying up. Because when you look at just the numbers of more residential, you would think that motor vehicle what it has would be somewhat impacted in that too, but you see that motor vehicle has gone down. Now, is there any way that we can get you to break down that information for us? Sure. What the sure. impact is on assessment of just growth in residential property? Sure. I'm actually going to get some slides that may help with that. In fact, this slide that I've got up, which is on page nine, Thank you, Mr. this slide shows the increase in property taxes from year 1996 to 2002 for and I went ahead and put schools, counties, cities, and, and the state on here. And uh, like I say, I'm going to give you the good and the bad. It looks pretty bad for the counties on here. Clint, is all of this uh, adjusted for the home homeowners tax relief grants yes. that the state, the $400 million? Well, that, that's included in it because that's all the tax relief grant is, is, is we don't charge the homeowner for that amount of money, and we get it from the state, but we lump it in with our property tax revenues and use it for whatever we use property tax revenues for. It's, it's the state is really paying a part of the homeowner's property tax bill, and, and we're getting a reimbursement from the state. We go ahead and give them the exemption or the, or the reduction in the property tax, and the state reimburses us for giving them that reduction. Over $400 million. That's what it's costing the state right now, right. over $400 million. Uh, this, anyways, this shows the... Um, actual increase in dollars in, in property tax um, over the last 10 years. As you can see, the, uh, the schools have gone up 51%, counties 88%, cities 60%, of other is probably authorities, and the state 64%. Um, so you can see in, in, on the left-hand column in billions of dollars how much uh, property tax has been increasing. Uh, this shows for the counties how much of the increase is taking place accounting for inflation and accounting for growth. In other words, new people moving in. We, um, we show it as a percent of personal income. So, in other words, back in 1993, property tax was making up about 2.3 percent of, of, of an average person's income or per capita income. Uh, 2003, that's gone up by 41%. It's about 3.2% of personal income. That's how much property taxes is, is making up. So it's gone about 41% increase. Um, and, and, this, and that 41% increase takes into account the inflationary and the, and the actual growth factors. Do you have any idea how we rank in comparison to other states in this category, yeah, there was just, just me, there was just a report that came out in Governing Magazine I, actually last week, and on um, on property taxes, I believe we were 34th in the country uh, in the ranking of the states as far as how much we charge relative to other states. We were we were 34, so we're towards the bottom as far as how much we charge. Uh, on the next page, page 11. This was a, these case studies have been done in several counties around the state. 
And I just picked two of them, but it's, it's pretty much comes out roughly the same in all, those, in all the counties that have had these studies done. But what it's highlighting here is that if you look at different classes of property, farm, commercial, industrial, residential, and, and manufactured homes, uh, for every dollar, for instance, that farm and forest pay, they get back in Grady County 38 cents worth of services. For Thomas County, you get back 67 cents worth of services. Uh, commercial gets back 10 cents and 38 cents for every dollar they pay. Residential, for every dollar they pay, they're getting back $1.72 and $1.64 in services. And this is including, this is not just the county government, this is, would include the schools also. Uh, in manufacturing homes, you see it's even higher. They get back $3.85 for every dollar they pay. Now this is a study just done on Grady County and Thomas County, but I've seen others uh, studies. The University of Georgia has done these studies in about 10, 15 other counties in the state, and it comes out pretty similar. This is just to highlight the fact that obviously residential, even though their share of the pie is going up, they still don't support themselves. If you got a, a very, if you got a heavy, heavily residential component of your tax digest, then you're not in real good shape long term. Uh, that's why counties and cities are always struggling to get more industrials. Uh, and, and, and uh, commercial property, especially. Mr. Chairman, I... Mr. Mills. A couple of pages back when you were talking about the changes in Georgia property tax levied uh, by taxing authority, and you said that uh, other, if I, if I heard you right, you said that other, other, which is the only negative, the only decline in there, had authorities in there. That's what other probably means. Yeah, this, we've got a, some authorities around the state that get a dedicated piece of a dedicated piece of millage to fund their operations. A lot of them were constitutionally created, but there there are several authorities around the state that do get part of our property tax to run, like development authorities, uh, are, is an example of an authority that, that may get some property tax revenue. Right, right. And the question comes to mind then: from '96 to 2002, there's been no doubt more authorities created, but yet it is the only area that has declined, and I was just pondering those thoughts. Um, I really don't have a good answer for that. We have a lot of development authorities, though, that, that have been created, but they're not being utilized. Um, we've had a lot of consolidation that's gone on in development authorities. Uh, you know, hospital authorities are probably included in that. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, they're not getting as much property tax revenue as they have in the past. Page 12 just really, again, highlights those two case studies and, and the percent of, percent of tax, property tax they pay versus services they get. Um, Want to switch to sales tax? That's about 22% of our revenues. That's We've got three types of local sales taxes. We have the local option sales tax. That's a 1% sales tax. We share that with the cities. That's based, on a, that's based on a negotiation that takes place every 10 years between the county and the city. And they send in a, a certificate to the Department of Revenue that says the county's going to get X percent of the money and the each city gets X percent of the money. And that's how the Department of Revenue makes the distribution back to the county and the city. Now this is for operations. We put it into our general fund and use it for operations. But it's supposed to be to offset property taxes. And on the property tax bill, we have to show a rollback on that property tax bill. So we take the total amount of lost money we got from the prior year, we say how many mills would that equal if we had to <coughs> levy millage to get that amount of money? And then we take that we, we take that amount of millage off the gross millage to get the net millage, which is what you pay the tax on. And that's how lost works. It's, it's a rollback or a credit against property tax. It's used for operations, it's used for the same services that we use property tax for. Uh, SPLOS, that's a dedicated 1%. That's used for capital expenditures. We have to renew that every five to six years when the voters have a referendum and, and they vote on a list of, of capital projects. Um, and we've got 151 counties that have SPLOS right now. We have 147 that have a loss. We have eight counties where the loss goes to the school system. And, 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 and we've got five counties that don't have a loss. Now, if you add all that up, the five to eight and 47, you get 160 counties. And you're probably saying, well, we have 159 counties in Georgia. Well, the one extra 
number there is because of Towns County. Towns County is the only county in the city that's actually got two laws. They've got a loss that goes to the school system and a loss that goes to the counties and the cities. Everybody else, it either goes to the counties and the cities or it goes to the school, but not both. In Mitchell County here, it goes to the school system, and in Houston County, it also goes to the school system. And then the Homestead Option Sales Tax, we only have two counties in the state that have this, Rockdale and DeKalb. This is sort of a hybrid between loss and loss. Part of it goes for property tax relief on residential homestead property, and part of the money goes for capital. 80% um, of it has to be spent on uh, residential homestead relief, and up to 20% of it can be spent on, on capital. A public utility and... Mr. And, Mills has a question. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Does ACCG have, have you ever looked at, uh, or has it ever been a point of discussion, the host tax uh, statewide? Well, we, the thing that we've looked at is we'd like to see counties have the option of any two of the three. Right now it says if you have a local option sales tax, you can't even consider a host tax. So there's only five counties in the state that, that, that don't have laws. So they're the only five in the state that could even consider a host tax right now. Um, we the cap is two pennies. You can only have two, but we would like to see counties be able to pick any two of the three. Right now, they can't do that. Um, public utilities and other enterprise funds. Again, this piece of the pie, even though it's thirteen percent, there's a lot of counties that don't have this piece of the pie. We have fifty-six counties that have that generate water or sewer or both water and sewer revenue. We have one county, Chris County, that has electric system and, and generates uh, revenue off electric. We have one county, Decatur County, that has supplies some gas to an industrial park. And we've got 13 that get revenue from air, uh, airports, uh, 64 that get it from solid waste, and then other is, I think that some of the airport stuff got lumped under other in, in their survey data, and there's some others there, but um, not every county has revenue from this source and this money has to be held separately from the from what we call our general fund which funds general operations. This is used for those those types of services that are quote supposed to break even. Uh, intangible and real estate tax that's two percent of our revenue. That's uh, collected on when you, people sell property is a tax on the sell of property and then also reporting instruments, uh, security instruments. Excise and special use tax this is, uh, most of this is our insurance premium tax. We get an amount based on our unincorporated population, and we're supposed to use our insurance premium tax revenues to fund services that benefit our unincorporated residents. If we don't have any services that primarily benefit our unincorporated residents, we're supposed to then uh, roll back the millage rate only on the unincorporated residents. So that's sometimes why you get a difference in the county unincorporated millage rate and the county incorporated millage rate. It's this insurance premium tax that would make that difference right here because the county is rolling it back on the unincorporated residents only. And that's per the state constitution that allows them to do that. But, but they should be using it for unincorporated services. The rollbacks as, as last resort only if they don't have any services that are provided only to the unincorporated residents. That's the biggest chunk of that. The franchise fees, the only one we get is cable. We don't get electric gas and the others. So 12% of this, 12% of the 5% is Table, uh, alcoholic beverages, hotel, motel tax. But again, you can see that all of those revenue sources combined are only 5% of our total, total revenues. Licenses, permits, and other regulatory fees. These fees also, we have to break even on these. We are not supposed to charge a fee that would exceed the cost of providing the regulation or, or, or doing the regulatory type service, such as building permits. We have a building permits department. Um, we can collect money to fund that building permits department through this fee, but we can't charge anything over and above where we just dump it in our general fund and use it as a tax. These are only to support the regulatory type activities. Uh, you see some of the examples here, alcoholic beverage, uh, business license, excuse me, business license and occupation taxes. That is on this slide because that's how the finance survey classified it, but that is really not accurate. It's not a regulatory fee. That's just a true tax. That's a general revenue source. That's a tax on, on business, the, 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 the license and occupation tax. Service charges, that's 4% of our revenue. There's a lot of little stuff in the service charges. This is an example of some of them. Ambulance fees, parking rec, 
parking fees, 911, planning and development, tag fees, false alarm fees. And this is only, there's a lot more than what's up there. Again, this is a long list, but it's, a, but it's all of them together still only make up 4% of our revenue, so it's a relatively small share. Grants, on average, about 3% of our revenue. We just gave you, again, this is a long list, but we gave you some examples of some state and federal grants that, that, that would make up this 3%. And then other revenues. Uh, and these are some examples of what would make up other revenues, and there's quite a number of these, too. All of these are in that handout that is in your folder. Um, and again, the, the biggest chunk of this 10% is the court fees and the constitutional officer fees. Uh, what I wanted to do is show you, just compare a couple of our counties with this statewide average that you've been looking at, because it does vary greatly when you start looking at each county individually. Uh, this is Butts County. Um, uh, they get 45% from property tax and 27% from sales tax, and you see the others. Uh, so they're getting a little, they're charging they're getting a little bit more of their revenue from property and sales than the statewide yes. average. Uh, Cobb County, Cobb County, up to this past year, did not have any local sales taxes. They didn't have a small car law, so that's why their property tax component is so large. 59% of their revenue is coming from property tax. Um, they just passed a SPLOSS this past year, so they'll, they'll, that property tax piece will shrink down a little bit and they'll have a sales tax slice starting this, this coming year. Uh, they get a lot, quite a bit too off their other revenues, which would be their court type fees and their constitutional officer fees. Uh, Emanuel County, uh, they get quite a bit from sales tax. You know, they get 34% and 42% uh, from property tax. Uh, Maybe some of the others there. Fulton, again, Fulton only has one local sales tax. That's lost. It's shared with the cities. And as was mentioned earlier, Fulton will be probably totally incorporated here in a few years. So that 8% is going to go down to probably about zero very <coughs> shortly. So that they, they are heavily reliant on property tax, uh, which uh, in light of recent uh, situations with the assessor's office, that's... <laughs> That's dangerous, <laughs> but you see how much property tax revenue makes up of their, of their revenue sources. Uh, they, they, without property tax, they can't operate. Um, Gwinnett County, I put Gwinnett County in here because they have a water and sewer system, uh, which is very large. It makes up 22% of their total revenues. Again, that's not, that can't be used in the general fund. Those are restricted to, that's used for their water and sewer utility. But for those counties that do have water and, and sewer, it makes up a, a pretty large chunk of their revenue. And it's usually our larger counties that have those types of utilities. And, and Gwinnett only has one sales tax, too. They only have a uh, sploss, not a law. Then there's Hall County. I'm going to run through these. Housing County. Housing County only has one sales tax. They give their other penny to the schools. The school gets a local option sales tax. Um, but they're pretty, they, they actually are pretty close to the state averages on their revenue source. Uh, Mitchell County. Mitchell County only has one sales tax. It gives one penny to the school. It's he pretty heavily reliant on property tax. It's, it's much higher than the state average. I think it's 56% there. They rely on property tax revenues. Um, well, what do we do with all this revenue? We have to, like the state, have a, a balanced budget. We can't go, we can't uh, spend more than the revenues that we have available from year to year. Uh, thing that's unique about counties is we have a lot of non-discretionary services that we provide. These are services that either the state of Georgia or the Constitution of Georgia has said county governments are going to do this and they're going to do it in all 159 counties in the state. So these aren't services that we can eliminate. And this is just a, this is a short list here. There's, it, there's more than this. But this is an example of some of the services here. You know, probate court, superior court, juvenile court, engine defense, land records, vital records, sheriff's office, jail, health department, funding. These are all the things that, that uh, some of the things that, that we do that the state says you will do these services and you will fund them. Now, I guess it's us, it's up to the local counties to try to determine what's the appropriate funding level to actually provide the service and and still remain in compliance with the Constitution of the state. And this is usually where your sheriff and your other constitutional officers get in the fight with the Board of Commissioners because the Constitutional Office says you're not giving me enough money to perform my state mandated services and the board of commissioners says well we're not we don't want to go up on taxes and this is what you're going to get and so that's where we get these lawsuits from between our constitutional officers and our board of commissioners 
Uh, everybody wants a piece of the pie. These are some of the, again, this is sort of how we spend our money here in broad categories. Um, and I can give you a breakdown of what's in these broad categories if you want, but I'm not going to have time to do it in this presentation because I think I've already gone over my time. I've got some questions. And I want to thank the few people that helped us put this presentation together, Mike Bush, DCA, and Bob Isler with UGA. And is there any questions I can answer? Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, thanks, Clint. That was a lot of work that went into that, and I, and I want you to know we appreciate it. Uh, one of one of my goals in going through all this, and, I, and, and the city people that are here and the school boards, I'm going to ask you the same question so you can go ahead and start thinking about it. Uh, we just have come through probably as severe a downturn in our economy as I remember in my adult lifetime in 03 to 05 area. Uh, certainly statistically proven out to, to be so. And uh, one of the things I'm trying to get a handle on are what are or what would be prudent, adequate reserves for, for government. Uh, a lot of people refer to property taxes, for instance, at the county level and the city level and the school board level as, as the safety net or the buck stops here. When the state has to impose draconian cuts in revenues, and the services still have to be provided by mandate, the only place to pick that up is in the property tax in many in many cases, mm -hmm. especially when the other more volatile taxes, like sales tax, for instance, in any given one-day period of time may, may be at variance. The sure, the sure bet for those services is the tax. So I don't blame the counties and the cities at, at all for these kind of percentage increases over the period of time that we have just gone through, which was essentially unprecedented. Things are good now, so we can look at the formulas. But I'm interested in your opinion as to what are adequate reserves at the government level that you represent. And then we are going to be toying committee with ideas of what are adequate reserves for us to fund both state government and all of the local governments under our umbrella that rely so so desperately on, on us to do that. When we don't fund schools, property owners have to fund schools. That's simply what happens. You know, you can't ask the kids, don't come to school. So what happens in these downturns is predictable. I think we saw the percentages here. I've heard, and I want your opinion on this, that three months worth of operating expenses is an adequate reserve. Uh, I looked at the state situation. When, when our economy went down we supposedly had the $700 million reserves, but in a $16 billion budget, that's two weeks. Obviously, that wasn't enough because we had to make several cuts that trickled down to the local levels as well and, and precipitated a lot of these out-of-balance increases. I don't say that's the only reason fiscal responsibility figures in. There's a litany of, of reasons, but I'd like your opinion on what adequate reserves are and is there any idea that you all may have on some formula driven if from the standpoint of needs of local government which you represent as opposed to our ability to, to fund. Now I know the state's never ever done an unfunded mandate uh, <laughs> that, I, that I hear from and I'd be, I'm being facetious on that but there's certainly more draconian during bad times and now are good times so we can do some serious planning about this. What's your idea on adequate reserves? At our level, where we need to be at to make sure your level is always going to be stable, and and sort of characterize your taxes as what you consider most volatile and least volatile, and if you had recommendations for policy changes as your relationship between us and you, us meaning the state, you meaning the counties, let's hear them. Okay. Um, as far as the reserves, that's going to vary depending on the size of the local government or the size of the county. Um, Generally, a reserve of about three to five percent of your of your revenues is, is what people would like to see the county have. Uh, and, and when I say people uh, say you finance and have to go out and, and issue bonds, when the when the uh, rating agencies look at you, uh, the bonding people, and they look at what's your fiscal health, they're going to be looking at your reserves. How much what we call unreserved fund balance do you have? That's that's money that's uh, sort of emergency fund money that you can use on spending, spend on anything you need to spend it on, and it's that's usually around three to five percent. But that that will change depending on the size of the government. In other words, a large county like the size of Fulton, it's going to be a smaller percentage. It may be two to three percent of what? Percent of, of, what? of, of percent of your budgeted revenues. 
whatever that amount is, two, three percent of your of how much of the revenues that you take in every year. Your annual revenue. Of your annual revenues. Um, for the smaller counties, like a Mitchell County, uh, it may be you know five, six, seven percent. They may have to have a larger reserve than, than the larger county does because obviously four or five percent of their budget is not going to be really as much money. Um, but on average, just to, again, about three to five percent of, of budgeted revenues, and maybe when Sabrina gets up here, she can address that too because she teaches this stuff. <laughs> but uh, and so so that that does change. But um, it is important. And a lot of times counties don't have the adequate revenues, and when we go through times like we just went through, uh, they get in trouble. Fortunately for us, because property tax makes up a large component of our revenue base, property tax is probably the most stable. When you look at income tax and sales tax, property tax is, is the most stable revenue source. Um, and uh, sales tax obviously is going to fluctuate greatly. Good thing about sales tax is what we use it for. Uh, only one of those pennies goes into general opera operations. The other one is dedicated to capital expenditures. And, to the credit of Chairman Richard Royal, he's done a good job. There's been several occasions where people have wanted to use that for operations, and Richard said, no, we're going to make sure that that stays and is used for capital. See, a capital expenditure, you can always scale back on the project. You can delay the project. There's things that you can do when the sales tax revenues go down. Uh, but operations, you've got to, that, that, that's hard to change the, the amount you need for operations. So because we only use one penny for operations and we use the other for capital, our revenue sources are pretty pretty stable. Uh, I think the, 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 the only thing that's bad about our revenue sources is, is the property tax because it, it's, it's the most disliked of the revenue sources and it happens to make up a large percentage of our budget. So when people complain, they come to the county commissioner. And not only, as you saw in this slide, schools are <coughs> using about twice as much property taxes as we're using, but I guarantee you the commissioners get four to five times the blame. I mean, when people complain, they're going to their county commission. They're not usually going to the cities or the schools. They do go to those other folks. I don't want to say that they don't. But from from what we hear from our county commissioners, they get most of that blame. They, I've, had, I've had counties that say, well, you know, we cut our millage, the school raised theirs, and we still got all the blame for for the the the, uh, the gross increase in total property taxes. Um, I assume you're going to make a recommendation maybe later and submit it to the committee then as far as any policy changes you see that would that would better deal with the volatilities and also what your recommendations on re suggested reserves might be? Yes. Today whatever your reserves need to be, we kind of have to have a secondary reserve over that so we can predict maybe from economic changes when these things may have to kick in. A lot right. better than we did before. I don't want to get another hurricane economic Katrina like we right. before. Today we were just asked to sort of present the revenues and obviously we have a lot of policy issues we'd like to discuss with the committee. We mentioned some of those at your first meeting, but we will continue to, to give you all written information and maybe at some of the other meetings talk more about some of the policy concerns. And I mentioned the constitutional officers. That's that's another very difficult area for the counties because one of the basic principles of good tax policy is the person that act is in charge of collecting the revenues ought to be the same person that's accountable for spending the revenues. And we have a disconnect in county government. It's the only level of government where we have that disconnect. The person in charge of collecting the revenues is the county commission, but the person that's charged of spending those revenues in the, in the constitutional officers, which are our, our sheriff, our superior court, our tax commission, those those areas of the county, they we can't really tell them how to spend. We can't tell them how to spend the money at all. Now we can we can cut their total budget, but it's hard for us to know where to cut when we don't even know what they're doing. We have no we don't really know what their operations and what they're doing. They're only going to give us a limited amount of information. So that's that's really a sticky point in county government is we're responsible for collecting the revenues, but we've got another body out here that's not responsible for collecting the revenues. Not going to take any heat for collecting the revenues. They're in charge of spending the revenue, and, and the only heat that they take is if they don't provide an adequate level of service. Are you? Yes. Representative Tumlin. I'm fine. Yeah. Representative Martin. Just real quick, when you talk about um, reserves and the reserve fund balance for whatever, I remember when I was leaving GMA in 90, well, whatever year it was, 2000, there was talk about adopting sort of a policy across counties and cities of, of various designations for reserves and accounted for fund balance. Because a lot of times cities and counties get under pressure and, and they don't develop a sinking fund for the new fire truck and then all of a sudden they come out. Has any more work been done 
toward that to, to develop a you know sort of a policy or a model to help counties in Georgia plan yeah. on that. That that goes into what the chairman was saying about you know planning forward and you need more than three percent ahead if you if you got a you know some fire equipment that's going to need to be replaced in four, five, ten. You know. We try to do that in our training. All the county commissioners in the state have to go well. They have to go through new commissioners training, then they go through a basic and an advanced level, mm -hmm. most of them do. And Sabrina teaches most of those courses. And we teach them what adequate reserve means and what, what they should be looking at long term. But that's all we do is try to educate them. I mean, beyond that, we, we don't do anything else. Thank you. Any other questions from this meeting? Thank, Thank you, Clint. We appreciate the time and the efforts that you've put forth in, in bringing these numbers to us. I've got to wait and see if we need House information may need to change tapes if they all took a break. Let's we'll see if we can go ahead and get some money. Okay, we're going to call on uh, Gwen Copeland Hall, Associate Counsel for Georgia Municipal Association. where the county folks as a couch there is in a percentage of their overall annual predicted revenue collection. Why, why the difference? Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure. I think uh, I think you would find most cities would, but I, but I think if you convert that 3 to 5 percent, I don't know, it may fall in that range of 30 to 90 days. So. My, my comments were just what the accountants, general accounting standards say and what the bond people say, not, you know. Right. Larry's a manager, and the manager's going to do things different. They're going to look at their unique situation in their county. And like we have some counties that collect their property taxes after their fiscal year or the end of their fiscal year, so they're going to have to have a lot larger reserves to make it through to the end of the year. We have other counties that collect the property taxes before their fiscal year starts. And then we have some in the middle. They're all over the place. So those that collect the property taxes on the back end, they've got to have huge reserves, or they've got to borrow money, one of the two, to get them by until they get their major revenue source, which is at the end of the fiscal year. And as far as the uh, property taxes, I think that uh, property taxes in relation to, say, an investment portfolio, that would be your stable piece of your portfolio, the conservative stable piece that you can count on. You have other taxes that are going to be somewhat volatile. Sales tax may be. And if sales go down, then you'll see a, a resulting uh, decrease in occupational taxes because so many cities base their occupational taxes based on gross sales. So you see you've got that stable piece of your uh, operation and that is the property tax piece that's very important. Generally getting started, we'll Clint covered a lot of the uh, information in terms of the types of revenue, so we may go over that a little more quickly, but 
Uh, the message we want to convey today is that there really is not a one-size-fits-all approach to operation of local government and cities in terms of their revenues. Cities need more flexibility <coughs> and options rather than less. Uh, different cities provide different services and have different resources. Uh, there is a diversity. Having a diversity of revenue sources is very key. And I think you'll see the cities are very low cost, low tax, and revenue diverse, and they really serve as economic engines to help grow the economy. Um, first major source of revenue is property taxes. That's been discussed. Uh, those are set by local elected officials when they uh, set the millage rate, which they're required to do each year. Sales tax, there's three primary uh, sales taxes for cities. You have the local option sales tax, which is negotiated between cities and counties every 10 years. The SPLOS, which is now negotiated between cities and counties. And of course, the city of Atlanta is the first city to have a most tax, a municipal option sales tax, 1% to pay for their water and sewer infrastructure. And that's certainly a tax that cities are quite interested in. The fourth tax, the host tax, is not listed there because that is not a revenue source for cities. In terms of other taxes, you have a number of alcohol taxes that are based on uh, sales, beer tax, wine tax, distilled spirits tax, liquor by the drink. And you also have hotel motel taxes, which can range from 3 to 5 percent, and that's determined by state law and how that money is utilized by the local government, and then an auto rental tax as well. Other taxes include the occupation tax, which that's established by the city council, uh, the financial institution's business license several insurance premium type taxes, and then a gross receipt, tax receipt on utilities, and that's mainly uh, Bell South. The telephone company is really the primary one in lieu of a franchise fee that pays a gross receipts tax. Penalties and interest is a category that kind of speaks for itself. Licenses and permits. Uh, in addition, uh, alcohol sales are basically a privilege under state law, so there's a payment for having the right to sell alcohol in a community. Then you have smaller categories like sign permits and so on and so forth. Regulatory fees, these are fees like building permits, uh, plumbing, electrical, mechanical. Those fees must uh, approximate the cost of providing the service, so those are not intended to be profitable services, but merely to pay for themselves. Charge for services include uh, court fees, cemetery fees, a lot of various and sundry fees. Those are primarily tied to specific services or paying for a specific service. And then, of course, you have general fees. That's like recreation fees, franchise fees. Uh, franchise fees are basically a contractually negotiated rental fee for the use of public right-of-way and other small fees there uh, as well. Interfund transfers. Uh, these are transfers from uh, a water sewer, solid waste, uh, telecommunications, gas, or electricity. Uh, these are generally done in lieu of a franchise fee. If the government itself is providing the service, it's making the contribution in lieu of paying a franchise fee as a private company would. And it's also to compensate the city, the general fund, for the services it's providing to that enterprise fund. Intergovernmental is uh, primarily grants and funds received from other governmental agencies such as DOT, GEMA, FEMA. Uh, T grants, uh, CDBG, so on and so forth. Fines and forfeitures, you have uh, court costs, confiscated items, ordinance violations, state law violations, but these revenues make up only one-tenth to one-eighth of the cost of a city providing the services such as police and courts. And then fine and forfeitures itself, this was actually asked about earlier. In FY05, municipal courts remitted over $26 million in fine add-ons to various statewide funds. And in addition to that, well, actually approximately $8 million of that was for indigent defense. And also about $10 million is uh, remitted to counties for several things, including the county jail fund. So collectively, you've got about $36, $37 million of cities are remitting to the state or counties through fee add-ons, and those now approximate about 30% of the fine. And of course, in the other category is interest, donations, rent, uh, capital assets and payment in lieu of taxes. And we do want to point out there are unmet needs. The uh, existing revenue sources for cities do leave some needs unmet, uh, particularly water sewer infrastructure replacement and expansion, road maintenance and construction, other transportation needs such as traffic signals and bicycle paths and greenway acquisition. <coughs> we, uh, in preparing this, got 
a revenue analysis or budget analysis from 25 cities, which represents approximately 5% of the cities in Georgia. Um, it would have been interesting to get them from all of them, but what we got from the 5% that we did get, and we tried to get a lot of diversity in there, it explained to us right off the bat that there really is no one size fits all. Different cities provide different services, and different cities do rely on different revenue sources differently. And hopefully what we'll show you today will illustrate that. I'm not going to go through every city just in the interest of time, but if you have questions, please feel free to ask them. We're starting out with Gainesville because as you can see from the slide, Gainesville looks like a, a pretty well-balanced revenue system. They don't rely too heavily on one source over another source. Um, it's actually a pretty attractive bar graph, uh, bar graph, bar graph pie chart, whatever it is. It's very attractive. Um, and uh, so it just is an example, and there are others in here too, but it just jumped out at me as a city that uses a variety of revenue sources very well. And it has pretty much all the potential revenue sources available to it, which you'll see that can make a big difference in city budgets. And the first example of one that doesn't, by the way, these are Gainesville's operating expenditures. You'll note with most of the cities that the vast majority or largest chunk of revenue goes to law enforcement, public safety, fire, police, municipal court, jail. Um, that is pretty well represented in most of the cities. Um, the city of Decatur, we put as an example to contrast to Gainesville directly. The city of Decatur doesn't get any sales tax money. The Cass County has a host, and that's not shared with the cities at this point. Um, the Cass County also has a MARTA tax, so there's no SPLOS that goes to the cities. And as a result, the city ends up relying very heavily on property tax to fund its um, general fund expenditures. And again, you can say, see Decatur spends a lot of its revenue on police and fire. Um, Decatur, incidentally, doesn't have a water sewer system. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Um, I'll skip over Canton because it's pretty similar. And Centerville is sort of the same way. It also doesn't have a local option sales tax. It does have a little bit more diversity, I think, than Decatur does, so its property tax is not quite as high. Um, I want to mention the city of Perry. It also doesn't have a local option sales tax. It does, however, provide gas service. So that makes a little bit of difference in its revenues. And you'll see that even more with Warner Robins. Um, its property taxes are lower, and it has this other revenue category that makes up 22% of the city total general fund revenues. And some of that does come from an airplane transfer from the gas system to general revenues. And again, that does go to serve as a, a franchise fee and also to pay for the administrative costs to the city for providing the service. Um, states for, again, some of these, I personally think they're all interesting. I encourage y'all to look at them. I'm just skipping in the interest of time. Um, the city of Pelham was another one that was interesting to us. They also don't have a local option sales tax, so they have to rely on property taxes and other sources of revenue. It's service charges or things like jail, jail and prisoner boarding fees, um, sanitation fees, and they do, I believe, have a gas system. Um, Moultrie, it, it's Another one, Moultrie and Camilla both, and so I'm just going to skip ahead to Camilla because they're fairly similar. Both of them, and Mayor Powell and Objective View, like both of them have electric, gas, water, sewer, telecom, cable, and other enterprise funds that help defray the property tax through paying that franchise fee and through paying the administrative fee um, since neither of these cities has access to a local option sales tax. And you can imagine. If they didn't have those enterprise funds to help out in their general fund, what their property taxes would look like since so they don't have a sales tax to offset them. God, how do you do it, Mr. Mayor? Um, Marietta, I'll mention that. Uh, they also don't have a local option sales tax. They are an electric city. And they, again, these enterprise, these enterprise funds aren't slush funds, but the 
you can see on some of the, the budget spreadsheets that it'll show you know five percent franchise fee or and that's sort of that's the way that it's looked at by those cities. They do make a big attempt to separate their business functions from the electric and the gas and the water and sewer function of the city. They treat them as business functions of the city as opposed to the general expenditure functions of the city. And, and for the most part, they try to draw very clear lines between those two functions. Um, another one that we're kind of transitioning and trying to show a few different things, the city of Griffin has an electric service. They also have sales tax and they also have property tax. So you can see a little bit more parity in the, the high graph there that there's no heavy reliance on one particular source of income. They're a little bit um, more equitable throughout their revenues. And they, like all the rest of them, spend a whole lot of money on police and fire. In their case, it's 59% um, of their total general fund expenditures. Uh, Calhoun, I want to mention simply because they are one of the few cities, there are I think 21 cities that have independent school systems, and there are a couple of them that actually fund the independent school system out of the general fund of the city. And Calhoun is one of those. You'll note on this slide that they do get 14% of their revenue from personal property taxes. Um, just to note, not every city is that high. Some of them are even less than 1%, but they have all the carpet mills up there, so there's a lot of inventory tax up there. And on the next slide, you'll see that Calhoun actually spends 40% of its total general budget on the school system. I'll skip over Thomas Belmont, just to move on to others in different categories. The city of Flemington is right outside of Pinesville, and they have most of, most of all the hotels that say Hampton and Pinesville are pretty much in Flemington. And so that is why they are able to rely on hotel motel taxes and occupation taxes and alcohol coverage taxes and insurance premium tax to make up the bulk of their revenues. They do not levy a property tax. Um, they use their local option sales tax to roll back the property tax so that they aren't, at this point in time at least, required to uh, levy one. And you'll see that even though Flemington is a city of around 300 people, they do provide a vast array of services. Valgosta, Larry's here, he might be able to speak to this a little more, but this is also. <laughs> but this is again one that's fairly balanced. They do rely a lot on sales tax, but that's just really an example that they are able to use their local option sales tax to reduce their property tax. And were it not for that local option sales tax, then their property tax would probably be uh, a lot higher. Extremely high. Our property taxes are 4.41 mills, and they'd be about 12 mills without the local option sales tax. And notably, under Valdosta's operating expenditures, 61% of, of their general fund expenditures go to police, fire, and municipal court, with another 6% going to public works, and that doesn't include what's in their, their water and sewer enterprise fund. Uh, Atlanta is its own animal. Um, <laughs> Just to, just to point out with this, this slide does not include the um, municipal sales tax that funds their water and sewer renovations. Um, that instead is, is listed in with their enterprise fund revenues. The 18.3% is from their local option sales tax. This is the Atlanta Court of a lot of services. Um, Alpharetta is pretty interesting. They, Alpharetta is interesting because if you look at their um, enterprise funds, they don't provide the water and the sewer, and they don't have electric or gas, they have solid waste. And there's not a whole lot of transfer from that, and so they do rely a little bit more on the property tax and the sales tax to roll back the property tax. And Representative Martin, you are much more familiar with Alpharetta's revenues and expenditures than I am, but uh, if you care to comment on that, that wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. 
Well, I think you captured it. Alpharetta is a, an interesting situation, and it, it's morphed over the last 10 years. Uh, what the gentleman said about a commercial uh, tax digest uh, to where more of uh, the, the property tax that you see there comes from the com commercial sector uh, that doesn't have I forget exactly what. I've been gone for four years now, but what the ratios make up are, are made up of. But the gentleman makes a good point that if you find that balance in the city, if you don't have these enterprise funds, that's the only way you can keep property taxes down for the individual homeowner. Um. I'll skip over Hinesville and Kingsland, which to me the interesting things about both of them is how little they rely on the personal property tax, and but they are fairly balanced, although they both have a little bit. Their property they lean on property taxes a little bit more than some like Gainesville and uh Augusta might. Swainsboro, I think, was um, they're pretty well balanced too. You'll see service charges makes up a pretty big chunk of theirs. And um, service charges for Swainsboro include things like residential garbage, commercial dumpster, uh, cell, cemetery lots, recreation charges, and golf course greens revenues, which I think is they have a wide array of those that they are able to rely on. And a lot of this, the revenues that you get are going to depend on the services that you provide because, as Larry said earlier, uh, a lot of the service charges and fees are designated to go into certain funds and they aren't shifted around. So if you look at Swain's gross general expenses, you can sort of see how that works with them spending 8.2% on recreation. It probably comes out of the 25% they get in their service charges. And they see the golf course up there too. And the last one I'll pin on before we close uh, we do have a few consolidated governments in Georgia. We've listed information from Columbus here. And it's interesting for me to look through this because there are different revenues that are available to consolidate governments because of their position as being counties too, but also different expenditures than cities have. And so I wasn't that surprised because I'd already gone through some of the other cities and seen that they all had varying um, revenue sources and varied in how much they lean on resources, and then of course they also had varying expenditures depending on what services their citizens wanted them to provide. But there were a couple of different ones that popped out in Columbus that made it even more unique. And they do provide, they have several enterprise funds that I, I think will show more specifically how to charge for a service based upon that service. Um, at the end of the <coughs> at the end of all that, we do have a demonstration of of uh, service revenues and expenditures by population group. I don't think though that having looked through 25 cities, you can actually say that that any of these population groups actually gives you any idea of what revenue sources as a whole and what expenditures as a whole are relied upon or provided by municipalities. It really, depending on what city you happen to be in or be looking at, the revenues and expenditures are going to be completely different. DCA collects that information by population category, so it's there for you to see, but I would encourage caution in uh, making assumptions based on populations because that's probably one of the least important criteria is you may have an interstate community, for instance, is going to look very different than a non-interstate or an agricultural or one that's a regional city or one that may have a university. So there's a number of factors that sort of influence what a city's economic profile may look like. Population is probably not one of the better indicators. In summary, um, going back to what we said early on, there really is no one-size-fits-all approach to revenue and operation of local governments. We do believe cities need more flexibility and options rather than less options. Uh, different cities provide different services and have different resources in their uh, economies, and of course their revenues reflect that. Uh, it's very important that cities have a diversity of revenues so that they do not have all their eggs in one basket or uh, have extremely high, safe property taxes so that they can spread that out over an entire tax base. And we believe cities are low cost, low tax, and revenue diverse, and they certainly help grow the economy. And with that, Glenn and I will be happy to try and respond to your questions. Question? I have one. Mr. O'Neill. Uh, 
how are franchise fees determined, the amount of them, or what's the formula for the franchise fees? They are actually contractually negotiated with the different utilities. The courts have ruled that if there's not an actual agreement between the city and the utility, that there's no, the city can't charge a franchise fee. So it's one term in an overall franchise agreement. Typically, Georgia Power's franchise fee is about 4%. That's what Georgia Power and the cities have determined is an appropriate compensation to the cities for use of the right-of-way. Atlantic Gas Pipes is based on the dedicated design day capacity formula that I can't explain to you, but someone else may be able to. Bell South typically doesn't, I think Bell South only has franchise agreements with seven cities, and so instead of a franchise fee, the city will impose on Bell South a gross receipts tax. And that's generally about 3% of gross sales. And then, of course, federal law caps the cable franchise fee at 5%. Generally 5%. Who actually, if I were to ask all these franchise or service providers, would they tell me they feel like they get treated fairly and equitably city by city? Or who actually determines the equity or the fairness in those contracts that you're speaking of that are negotiated between the cities and the franchise providers? The utility has to enter into an agreement with each individual city, and so it's a face-to-face negotiation and discussion between each utility and each city with which they enter into an agreement. A utility, I guess, could choose not to enter into that agreement, but then the city would somehow have to get compensated for use of the municipal right-of-way, or the utility might have to find another place to put its facilities. And also, most franchise fees are not actually paid by the utility. They're paid by the customer. Many are shown on the bill itself as a franchise fee, so the customer is paying it. The utility is merely collecting it and remitting it. And generally, the franchise fee is perceived as a cost of doing business. It's really the equivalent of when, and I'll take Georgia Power for an example because we've had the most discussions with them to learn about these lately. If they were to condemn property or purchase property in the unincorporated area, the cost of that ultimate purchase of the property is passed on ultimately to the consumer, and the rental of the municipal right-of-way is a similar real estate transaction, and it's passed on to the consumer in a similar way. And also, regulating that right-of-way gives cities, allows them to exercise some control. In most cities, you have multiple utilities and rights-of-way, from gas lines, power lines, water and sewer lines. There's often costs we incur in managing that. If we have a new development and we have to extend utilities, oftentimes we're having additional costs to bore underneath other utilities, so there are costs to cities from the mere fact that utilities are in the right-of-way that that revenue helps compensate for. I guess still, my question is, is there any formula for computation of the amounts, or is it up to each city with each utility for 10,000 different agreements? It is up to each city to negotiate an agreement, but I think you would find the standard probably 90% would be 3% phone, 4% power, 5% cable. Those are the standards. What's in existence that protects the consumers? Do they ultimately, like you say, wind up paying it? What protects them? Do they have any say-so in any of this? I don't think they have any more say-so than they would the rate that they're paying for that particular utility. It all goes into the rate base as determined and approved by the Public Service Commission. Terms of the agreement. Terms? No, how long are the terms? Typical agreement, how long would it be for? Franchise agreements with power companies can be, my city signed a 99-year agreement with Georgia Power. Generally, cable agreements would run 10 to 15 years. Phone agreements are generally much longer. But it is, in some cases, the government or the utility may want a shorter or a longer agreement, and in some cases you want to protect yourself from future unknowns by knowing you'll have that designated source of revenue, so you might agree to a four-year franchise agreement, but that's negotiated. I think that the utility and the city both do have the customer's interest at heart. The city is interested in making sure that it gets compensated for maintaining the right-of-way and all that goes into that and for the use of the right-of-way so that the cost of that doesn't then get 
piled on the backs of the city taxpayers, the utility, of course, is interested in keeping its rates low because there is still competition among utilities. Um, you know, there are people who go to the Public Service Commission from time to time and try to switch off of an EMC and onto George Power or vice versa or onto a, a city electric system. So there, there is a lot of awareness, I think, during these discussions about the ultimate impact on the consumer. Representative Tumlin. We don't want to ask you on most, you know, we saw some advantages of the enterprise fund, but aren't most of them funded by the full faith and credit of the city of the tax ideas? Yeah, that is correct. I mean, most of your bonds that you would issue would be backed by the full faith and credit of the city. Of course, that's another reason why it's extremely important. Those bonds are going to be rated and the interest you pay will be determined by your credit worthiness. And it's important to have good, stable, solid enterprise bonds. And I'd like to couple that with with uh, Chairman O'Neill brought up, do cities like that tend to have higher reserves in the three to five percent or the sixty to ninety days? Hey, well, your, your tax uh -huh. go from one mil to twenty-five mil, right? If you have bad utility. Generally, the way we would operate is we would have a fund balance in each fund. So there's a fund balance in whether it's the general fund, which is generally thirty to ninety days. In our case, right now, I think we're at about forty-five. We think that works well for us based on our history. And in our utility fund, we might have a higher fund balance because of some planned expansion that we want to use cash for on the front end. So each fund would have its own fund balance based upon your possible future planning and your, your past history and risk that you may have. Any other questions? I mean, Senator to who? You made the statement that you need more flexibility in setting city taxes. Could you give us an example of how you would want to have more flexibility that the state can address? And let me go a step further. When you set up here, uh, for example, on numerous occasions, you've got a uh, cemetery fee. Uh, I'm not aware of any city that charges a maintenance fee on a cemetery lot. They'll sell a cemetery lot. If I went to the city of Camilla now and bought a plot in the city cemetery, I can live in America's, uh, you know, they wouldn't show send me a bill for mowing that particular plot. So uh, is that what you're using as an example? I mean, that varies all over the place, and it's a local decision. Uh, how much they use public works, for example. The Georgia Department of Corrections puts a tremendous amount of state uh, inmate work crews available to our cities and counties, you know, to go out and particularly in public works. And that's a good uh, 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 flexibility on the state's part. But give us an example, for, if you would, of how the state could, if we so desire and elect to, give you more flexibility on the city level. Your cemetery example, I would respond by saying that, like in our case, we operate a cemetery, and if you were to go buy a lot, you pay $400, 200 of that would be for the cost of the lot. Uh, 200 would also then be put into a perpetual care fund that you would draw interest upon to maintain the cemetery in the future because at some point in time it's going to be full and you won't generate revenue from sales. So that really is the appropriate way to operate uh, an enterprise like a cemetery. In terms of taxes, I mean, one example I would give would be the most tax. That would be very attractive to cities and it would give us options, and those options might be that we could use that for additional capital, such as water and sewer needs, and a, a combination of further rolling back property taxes, which would be very attractive to the taxpayer. So if we had an option like that, it would give us flexibility to look at reducing some other uh, taxes that may be less popular with the public. For a community like mine, it's a regional city with 57% uh, of our sales come from outside of our city but yet all those put demands on our infrastructure, so that's a fair way for them to help pay for the demands of the same Our daytime population is 56% higher than our real that's population, true. so it's a, it would be a good fit for a community like mine. And as, as part and parcel with that, the state does cap local sales taxes right now at 2%, but it could be that voters might vote locally to impose an additional 1% on themselves over and above the 2% that's there now. I think you might see that. I showed you the city of Decatur earlier, and they've got 2%, but none of it goes to the city. And their property taxes are extremely high. It could be that the, the residents of the city of Decatur would be willing to make a trade and pay an extra sales tax instead of 
paying the proper taxes that they do. We had uh, listening sessions across the street during April and May, and by and large, at pretty much every listening session we had, cities expressed interest in a municipal sales tax so that their cities, their city residents could vote and decide if they wanted to reduce property taxes or fund capital projects through a city sales tax. Any other questions, members of the committee? We're going to take about a 10 minute break now. The handout that you have for me is much shorter than what you have received from the others, I believe. Um, it looks like this. Okay. No PowerPoint, we're just going to talk. And I'm going to try to give you a brief but thorough look at the revenue sources available to school boards and then just let you ask me whatever questions you have rather than drowning you in data and trying to stay asleep this late at this point. Okay. Um, the schools are funded, obviously, as you know, from federal, state, and local sources. <coughs> and in 2005, the latest figures that were available, 50.4% of the revenue to local schools came from the uh, state, 41.4% from local, and 8.2% from the federal um, government. I didn't go into federal funds because we have no control over that, obviously. Um, for possible state funding sources for K-12, there really are four. Um, first of all is uh, the big one, the general fund, and about 40% of the general fund does go to fund K-12 education. Appropriations go to local school systems through the QBE formula, categorical grants such as transportation, and other grants. Then there are also appropriations made to the Department of Education, RISAs, and other organizations like communities and schools and other groups um, who work to fulfill the mission of educating our children. A second possible state funding source would be the proceeds of general obligation debt, obviously bonds, or the capital outlay programs, or other expenditures as the General Assembly authorizes, such as this last year when they did buses for FY07. Um, a third source is the tobacco settlement money, and 17% of the state's amount of that $30 million every year is allocated to school nursing services. Uh, the fourth one is the lottery, of which K-12 has received nothing for several years. But that possibility is there for technology um, and the capital outlay. Um, how far the state funding goes, though, to pay for education services needed in the school system varies widely. Um, you'll hear the same refrain from me that you've already heard, that one size does not fit all. It varies all across the state. Um, although, as I just said previously, on average, 50.4% of the revenue of the school systems came from the state. That varies from 22% of one school system's revenue being from the state to 81% of another system's being from the state. Twelve systems received less than 40% of their revenue from the state, but in 17 systems, the, state's fund, the state funds were over 70% of their total revenue. Um, you can see the chart there of the five highest receiving systems from the state. It's not that they receive more money, it's just that that money is the largest mm -hmm. portion of their total revenue. And then the ones that are the least um, for the audience of uh, Pelham City is at 81%, Trine City, Lanier County, Chickamauga City, um, Dodge County and Bledford were tied at 74%. That was one for the top of my spot. Um, the bottom five, um, Atlanta City at 22%, Raven County 29%, Decatur City, Fulton County, and Green County. And restrictions on the use of funds. And I put this in not as a forum for complaining about the restrictions, but just as um, Chairman O'Neill brought up earlier, what do we do in times of fiscal crisis? When there are a lot of restrictions on the funds, it makes it even more difficult when we end up having to cut funds. Um, state funds come with a number of restrictions on how they may be used. 91% of the total QBE formula earnings are for salaries, so only 9% is left over for other operational costs. <clears throat> and that's the salary space on the state salary schedule. There are expenditure controls on the funds for direct instruction, media centers, professional development, and the 20 days of additional instruction. 100% of those funds must go to those programs with the exception of the 20 additional days, excuse me, instruction, and 15% of those funds can be used for transportation to those programs. Um, those restrictions apply to require local fund mills as well as the state funds in the formula. Um, in addition to those restrictions affected fiscal year 08, 
65% of all revenue, federal, state, local, grants, fees, must be spent in the classroom as defined in the state law. Uh, then we move on to the local sources of revenue. Ad valorem is obviously the largest source of revenue to local systems. Um, you had a, a really good presentation from Shea on property taxes. Um, so this, the next part of your handout really is redundant. There's 15 categories of property on which the taxes are levied. 10 categories of properties are totally exempt from ad valorem taxes. Um, there are 59 types of, types of homestead and property exemptions available once you consider all the various categories of property that they can fall into. Ten systems have a local option sales tax, the loss that has already been mentioned. That's the eight county systems plus two city systems. But the revenue is all over the board, uh, from Jeff Davis County at $4,600 in 05 to Houston at $16.3 million. And now, if we take out those two extremes, it gives us a much clearer idea. And if we take out those two, the average would have been $3.4 million per system raised in 05. Um, 19 systems reported an appropriation from the city council um, in lieu of letting the millage. 138 systems reported revenue from other taxes, such as real estate transfers and railroad car taxes. 62% of the systems received tuition payments. Those either came from individual students or from another school system um, paying to have their students educated there. All the systems received interest payments, but there was once again a wide variation from less than $150 in interest to over $5 million in interest. 53% of the systems reported revenue from grants and fee-based programs. Um, for capital outlay, the local boards can ask voters to approve a bond referendum and or have the SWAST, which has already been discussed. 41 systems currently levy millage for bonds. Only two systems have never called for the SWAST. Those are Burke and Chatham. Two systems have never been able to pass one, Fayette and Glenn. Uh, 48 systems have approved the SWAS three times. 164 have approved of it twice. So that <coughs> does appear to be a type of tax that voters in most areas are willing to pay in order to pay for the capital outlay. Um, obviously, there are multiple sources of funding available for the schools. Most of them come with restrictions on how they can be used. Those restrictions limit flexibility and creativity um, and also require the local funds to be raised as we saw the property taxes have been increasing over the last several years. Um, it's often best to focus on the big picture and I'm usually one of the ones preaching about let's look at the big picture. But this is one of those cases where the big picture tells us nothing new. We can look at statewide averages, but as you've seen from um, everybody really is presenting here today so far, once you start drilling down to the individual locations, the picture is very different on what brings in value. Um, the last chart there, uh, I kind of looked the same tactic that Clint did in looking at how we break down the valuation. I looked at the net m and digest for school operations, and it was both boards at over five for this one and broke down what it was that gave value there. And you can see that the, res uh, the statewide average residential is 51%. Affluent County is only 18% of their net digest. Uh, Brooks was 33%, Cobb 37 Douglas 69 and there wasn't a rhyme or reason for how that I just picked them individually. Um, and it varied all the way across conservation use. Uh, Brooks County had 21% of the land that way. So, once we look at all these differences in how we gain value and how we use it, it presents a very difficult picture for all of you. Um, so I look forward to working with you as you try to work your way through this, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions, Mr. O'Neill? More, more of a dilemma, I guess, in my mind than a question. Uh, it, it always really sounds good to say we're all for local control especially when it's dealing with our schools and our, our systems. And I think that implies, too, the parents of the children in the system. But when you cross that line of local control could mean a lesser quality education to County X than County Y chooses by their own citizenry to provide, philosophically, what's your opinion? Is local control more important or in the education of our children? in the long run more important in that particular analysis. 
easy questions? <laughs> I think, first of all, we have to define global control. I think that in its broadest sense of the way that we really think about it most often, we're talking about the power of the voter to affect a decision in their local area. So when we're talking about local control of the schools, we're talking about those who have registered to vote and choose to exercise that right. <coughs> Elected the school board who hires the superintendent, who hires the principals, approves all those things in the day-to-day -day running of the school. And that that's how they control locally how their schools are run, what programs they offer, what their taxes are. Another aspect of local control is when we don't like what they choose to do. Let, let me stop you okay. there because I want to be fair to you. I mean okay. from the perspective only of taxation. Of taxation? Not, I don't want to get into the whole philosophy because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not qualified <laughs> to even hear an answer. I'm not going to ask the question. I don't want to get philosophical. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. But, but, no, but I, I, and more specifically, the two taxation. counties have never approved a swap. Yes. Why is it fair to all the other counties that have? And, and what should the state's position from taxation be when that happens? I mean, should we then fill their void because they were un, uh, unwilling to kind of step up the plate for their own kids? So we just jump in there and say, well, that's fine, y'all were unwilling. We'll get your children up the car with the rest of them, or should we not? That's the kind of taxation. That's a very good question. The equalization grant was designed to try to be the carrot to change that so that if they would raise their millage, then they would get more money through the equalization grant, so that was designed to encourage them to do so. And most of them have. But when it comes to paying for the building of their schools, there's really a, a set way the state provides funds for capital outlay, so I don't know that we can make much inference from the ones who have or have not chosen to pass a SPLOS, because they aren't going to get any more money from the state by not raising local funds. They simply don't have those physical facilities there. Um, as far as the operational costs, and, and I know we're all aware of the lawsuit um, pending um, and, and where that brings us on when children are not offered the same quality of programs or the same number of programs in one part of the state as they are in another. And I think we're just beginning to see the point where we're going to have to figure it out. And I, I can't give you a definitive answer. Um, I guess is the bottom line of that. But that is something that we have to consider. Whose responsibility is it? And what exactly is the responsibility? Um, it, constitutionally, it is the way that the Constitution states it, it is the duty of the state of Georgia to provide an adequate education to the children. And then later in the Constitution, they devolve the control and management of the local schools to the local boards. Can they devolve the duty to provide the education? I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> so I'm not going to go there for that one. But, the, and, and as you also are, are well aware, the governor has an education finance task force also looking at these same kinds of questions. And it does get down to taxation because if we decide what it is the state is responsible for, whether it is actually providing it or seeing that it is provided, then what is the state obligation as far as paying for it? And how do we do that in an equitable manner when the population is growing, the population is changing? Um, we have such diversity in so many ways in our state. And I think that we need another, uh, I hate to say this because we've had so many task forces that have ended up doing nothing. But I mean, they, they work hard. <laughs> but in the end, the political will is not there to follow through. And I would say that we're at a point in Georgia where we really need to do that. We need to take a thorough look and, and make some hard decisions. I don't know that I've ever heard the argument framed better than, it, than you just did. And if you have further ideas before we disband this committee, we're cool. most interested in, in hearing from you. Thank you. Senator Hooks. Senator Hooks. Let me, if I could, thank you, uh, Mr. Roy. Let me see if I can build on that question just the least bit. I have some counties, for example, and granted all of mine are rural counties and small mm -hmm. counties, but I have one county, for example, that has passed a splash, but 
yet one mill of tax in this particular county is $51,000. Okay. So if you go to the 20 mill cap, and they're pretty close to the 20 mill cap now, if you go to 20 mills, you have a spot with one grocery store in the county that doesn't generate any income back to a sales tax or whatever. Uh, you've already merged, you have consolidated high school. We have a lawsuit right now, which because I hope we work out, pray that we can work out before we get to court. It's in the breast of a court in Fulton County that's saying, you know, County X over here, which I just described in my own Senate district, and it be true of several of us on here, is already at the, they're doing all they can do. I mean, what is what are we going to do, and what is the answer, what is the option as far as taxes? I mean, I, I look down at this thing, and I see Brooks County's at 27 on con, uh, 21 on conservation mm -hmm. use, and 31% uh, agriculture. This probably would be greater in this particular county I'm describing. What are your thoughts on that? And I'm, I'm really not, I, I don't know what I need an answer or what I dread your answer or what. I'm a little bit like uh, uh, Representative O'Neill. I think your question goes to the same issue as, as Chairman O'Neill's did. And I don't know. I, there has to be some measure of local effort um, when it comes to state aid. And one answer could be, and this is really off the cuff, so don't hold me to this one, but um, we have the QBE formula, which really, whatever variation we come up with, there probably will be a foundation formula amount and a local part of it. But another element could be that we somehow derive a formula to measure what the local effort is. And once it reaches a certain threshold, then they would be eligible for additional state aid if they have a low property wealth, but they have taxed themselves. They have said, we want to be able to educate our children and we're willing to pay the taxes. <laughs> but the industry's not there or whatever's not there that increases the value of their land. Then we then say, yes, you have made the appropriate effort. Now, equalization tried to do that to some degree, so I'm not sure how we have to tweak that. But I, I do think it has to be both. I mean, we can't it can't be either the state or the local. This has to be a cooperative effort. And in those places, I, I would also say, in all honesty, that whenever families make the decision to live in one place, they make it based on a number of variables. One of them is the quality of life. They like the agricultural place. They like the quiet, the smaller place. They don't want to be in Atlanta with all the traffic and people living on top of each other and the smog and all those other things. So we trade off. We say, I'm willing to give up this in order to have this. So at some point, I think we also have to recognize the consequences of personal choices. As I said, we have a lot of hard decisions. And there are no easy answers. There are no really comfortable answers. Well, we already have um, sponsors. Some we reason. already have low wealth. Mm -hmm. Both of those can be applied. But if you carry 20 mills and you're still not going to have you still don't have it. I know. I know. And you and, consolidate and, the high schools, you still don't still have it. Well, and that kind of gets back to something that was in uh, GSBA's presentation last time. Um, we focused in several places on the changing demographics and how increasingly the population was going to shift according to the projections by OPB and a number of other institutions that have published papers. And as the population shifts to within the metro area and further north, then obviously the population is going to drop in other places. At what point is a county or a school system or a city no longer viable? And I don't know the answer to that. We have a number of very small systems. Tolliver um, County School System um, really is only managing because the whole system, one school, um, is a charter school. And so they get additional federal funds because they're a charter school. If it weren't for those additional federal funds, they would not be able to survive. So those are some of the other unfortunate and difficult things that we're electing you to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> That was a deep punt, I'm telling you. <laughs> a lot of hang time on that one. <laughs>
Angela. Yes. There's a, a funding formula study going on now, isn't there, about yes, education there funding? Can you bring us up to speed about where that is and the possible recommendations that may be coming uh, forth? They, I believe, have gotten off track on their timeline. Uh, they, their next meeting is July 24th in Rome, if any of you would care to attend if you happen to live um, out in North Georgia. Um, Dean Alford is chairing it. And I, no, I did not hear this from Dean, but I heard recently that they will probably announce then that they will not be able to meet the timeline. They had originally planned to issue a report in late November of this year um, of what their suggestions would be, and then and the next uh, General Assembly session start to work with the General Assembly on what legislation would need to be passed to address that. Um, right now, they have not even come up anywhere close with estimating what the cost would be. Their approach has been to come up with an estimate of the cost of an excellent education for a child in Georgia. And they're nowhere close. So I would say that you're probably looking at at least two more years of the QBE formula without any um, changes to it, um, if not three more. Because it's, it's, I mean, as you well know, it's going to take a long time once whatever the recommendations come forward. Um, it's going to take time to work that through legislatively. May I ask you a technical question? We have a charter school here in Mitchell County. Mm -hmm. The Mitchell County Board of Education, through contractual agreements, funds FTEs at a certain rate. Capital outlay money. Is the charter school eligible for any of that capital outlay money or not? Oh, Chairman Royal. <laughs> charter school laws really need some work if you want charter schools to be a viable option. Um, right now there's very little facility funding. Um, the General Assembly usually puts in one small line item, about 400000 um, for all the charter schools, and that's really for repair. There is no funding for uh, purchasing uh, land. Uh, for a charter school, they have to do that on their own. Um, so really, no. They have to come up with that by themselves. Okay. Any other questions? We certainly appreciate your expertise and in, 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 in your presentation, and we'll be talking more. Mm -hmm. Sabrina Cape, Call Vincent Institute.
So this deals um, in large degree with the um, operations of the cities and counties versus the capital. And the reason that we developed TED was I've been working with the Vincent Institute for about five years. And after 2001, um, Chairman O'Neill is right. Economically, there were a lot of things that happened in cities and counties and the state government. And as a result, what you found was that more cities and counties found themselves with financial trouble than ever before. And there were a couple of reasons for that. The downturn in the sales tax, um, the downturn in the ability of people to be able to pay the, the fees and the taxes they were already able to um, pay. So as a result, TED was established to help educate folks on how to spot financial distress and how to actually determine if they were heading in the right direction or not heading in the right direction. And what you do with TED, and I have chosen the consolidated governments because they're neither city or county, so you get to see a, a combination. And what you do inside this website is you go in, and I've picked athens Clark County in this example, um, and I have compared them to two of the other consolidated governments that we have data on, which is Augusta, Richmond, and uh, Columbus, and Skokie. And there are a couple of things inside TED that you might want to be aware of. One, this data that local governments have been submitting, they've been submitting since 1985. So there's 1985 through 2004 data inside here. The other thing is, um, just like someone said earlier, there's different times when you compare yourself to different cities or counties. Population may or may not be the best choice. It may be that you need to compare yourself with other utilities or with other governments that their digest looks like you. The first part of TED is the fiscal diagnostic. And the fiscal, fiscal diagnostic page just looks at the government that you have selected as the primary government. And what it does is it's pretty simple. Plus, good thing, minus, investigate further. It doesn't necessarily mean a minus is a bad thing. And we've been working with rating agencies um, on developing these fiscal diagnostics. There's been a lot of questions today about how much reserve is enough. Um, you're never going to get everybody to agree on that answer. The finance person is always going to tell you you can never have enough. And the person who's paying to accumulate that fund balance is always going to tell you you don't have any. So that's always going to be the struggle. GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, their recommendation is one to three months of your operating budget. Not your capital budget, but your operating budget. But they say to do one to three months of your operating budget if you have stable sources of revenue that come in at staggered periods of time. So what you will find is those pies that you were looking at from um, ACCG and GMA's comparison, the more equally distributed those pies are, then sometimes the lower that fund balance might actually be. Now when it comes to the utilities as far as the reserve, you'll notice this fund balance is just dealing with um, the governmental funds, which means those funds that are funded by taxes. When it comes to the utility funds, there's something that typically protects the utility fund, and that is called the covenants inside the debt documents when they enter into bonded debt. Because when they enter into bonded debt, there's something in there that typically will say how much they have to have in reserve. And so those uh, lenders will protect themselves by the reserve and they will sometimes call that a debt service <coughs> coverage component or something of that nature. So the utility funds and the governmental funds have a little bit of a difference. A um, couple of trends that we started to see. Fund balance can go up for a majority of reasons, but the reason you want fund balance to go up is because revenues are good and expenses are down. You don't want fund balance to go up just because you've been able to go to the bank and borrow money. So when you start to look at the fiscal diagnostics, you want to make sure that fund balance is going up, but that your debt isn't going up together. So that's why we look at debt in um, the fiscal diagnostic. We also look at revenues to expenditures because trends are, if a local government tends to overspend in one of three years, it's typically a signal that there's a pattern. And so you want to uh, take a look at that. But when it comes to the revenue side of TED, 
What this does is it doesn't look at the general fund. It doesn't look at any of these special revenue funds. It looks at the city as a whole or the county as a whole. And it, it eliminates all these inner fund transfers that may be occurring between these funds. All of that actually gets eliminated. So you can um, see that when we start to look at things inside TED, you can either look at percentages or you can look at dollar amounts. And you can start to see, in this particular example, Columbus and Scobie is um, more reliant upon the category of taxes than its counterparts of Augusta, Richmond, and athens Clark. And you can also see that um, athens Clark and Augusta, Richmond are much more reliant on charges for services. And when you drill down into TED, you can drill down and see further data. So it was extremely important how you carved this pie up because everybody sometimes calls all these revenue sources a different name. And they slice them and dice them a lot of different ways. But House Bill 491, which was passed in 1998, was actually what established that uniform chart. And that uniform chart is how TED is laid out. So all the categories of TED match what the uniform chart says, and it matches what um, the, the descriptions are. And um, there's lots of people that might not have um, been a strong advocate of the chart. But one of the great things about the chart is that it will have, with each revenue line item, it will have the code section of the Georgia law that enables you to collect those revenues. A um, couple of little things about TED. You can keep drilling down into the various levels and you'll notice we have a little bobble here. Instead of mo motor home tax, it's mobile home tax. Um, so I um, want to make sure that everybody understood what those were. Um, but you can even drill down to see the um, various types of taxes. And again, this is taking DCA data that, the, that local governments submit, and it's blending it with Department of Revenue data that they actually submit. Um, another interesting category of the revenue section is the intergovernmental uh, category. The reason intergovernmental category becomes a little interesting is not necessarily um, from the standpoint of how many state dollars, but also from the standpoint of how many federal dollars are actually flowing into um, the city or county. And remember again, this is operational in nature, not capital in nature. So you can, um, one of the things on that pie um, that you've been seeing throughout the day is that the local government can get and leverage their money from multiple sources, then of course they have a much greater uh, chance for success. And again, inside TED, you can switch at any time and you can look at dollar amounts instead of looking at percentages to give you data so that you can compare yourself. And you can also change your comparisons on the fly. Say, for example, you're comparing yourself to a government, and then you find out, oh, well, they don't have a utility I need to change, then you're able to do that. One of the um, areas we get the most questions about with respect when we do elected official training is, tell me some user fees or charges for services that maybe we can charge that we haven't been charging. And what you will see is those governments and those pies that have lower property taxes typically have that piece of their pie, the charges for services piece, is uh, oftentimes a little bit bigger. And one of the parts of tra uh, charges for services that kind of sticks out at you is whether some of these local governments have utilities or whether they don't. But remember again, the, the authority data is not yet in this website. So a government may have an authority and if it, that data is not included in here, then right now this may be a little bit misleading and we're working on getting that at it. Um, when it comes to the utilities, not only is it important to know what utility, um, that it has utilities, but which utility that it actually has. Because if you're an electric, you don't want to compare with a non-electric. If you're a water sewer, you don't want to compare with a non-water sewer. And it, um, then when it comes to the expenditure side, we follow those same nine categories, and those same nine categories are outlined by the uniform chart, and you can drill down into the detail and find out how much is being spent in each one of these categories per um, city or county. 
The uh, public works areas is the area that I chose here just for demonstration purposes. And the reason is because if, if the government has a utility, then of course you would naturally expect the public, the public <coughs> works expense side to actually be a little higher because they have the utility. Now, for the um, members on your uh, seat or inside your packet, I have run some information off of TED for your particular um, city or county that might be in your area. And I, I've just run some different screenshots to be able to show you a little bit about what yours actually looks like. And the way that you access TED, just for those of you who might be interested, and um, we, we've got several folks in the room that have already seen TED, and we've got uh, several folks in the room that have already been uh, looking at TED and the data. You go to the Benson Institute website, which that website is right there, cbog.uga.edu, and then you click in the lower right-hand corner on the Tax and Expenditure Data Center. And right now, you don't have to create a login account. All you do is click Login. And what will happen is it will ask you which government you want to be, that's your preference, and which government you want to compare yourself to. Um, when we went through this process of collecting this data, there were a couple of things we found out. One was that in the DCA survey that was being done, there's no information collected on fund balance reserves for cities and counties. So the Department of Audits actually helped us assemble what fund balance existed for cities and counties. Um, also, in your data, if you have a dash in a data cell, that is because that data has not been loaded or is not available. If you have a question mark in any of your data, that is because we don't have the data. And um, if you have something and if you start to look at your data and you start to say, well, wait a minute, some of this may not look exactly right, um, that's because of, it's still in the testing mode, but it, it, it is um, very, very reliable. Um, but it is survey data. And there is a difference between survey data and audited data. Survey data, you get a lot more detail. Audited data, you get a lot more accuracy. So there, there's a, a trade-off between the two. So, um, and what we found is with the um, education data, there is a similar process. They submit survey data to one place and submit audited data to a different place. So there's, those are two different um, entities. Um, but I would like to do a live demo if any of the members would like to um, suggest a particular city or county to look at. Or, to show how to navigate? We can look at Sharpsburg because that would be real quick. Okay. <laughs> Just click log in. Okay. You change your preference to a city. And we're going to choose Sharpsburg. And we're going to apply the unit of analysis. Do you want to compare Sharpsburg to anybody? Or just to yourself? Yeah, let's compare it to some. Okay, so we want to compare it to. Let the house pick a city to compare it to. Swainsboro. Swainsboro, there you go. Mountain Park. Population 23. I'm just picking it down. I'm just picking it down. I'm just picking it down. I'm picking it down. I'm just 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 picking it down. Anybody else you want to compare? Okay, that's enough. So you apply the units of comparison, then we go to the fiscal diagnostics and we take a look at Sharpsburg. This is always great. And you will see that fund balance data doesn't exist. And if you if you click on that, then you start to see that. And it may be, here's why. Um, Sharpsburg, if the receipts of a city or county are less than $300,000, then they're not required to submit an audit. They just do a grade upon procedure, so fund balance isn't recorded on a grade upon procedure. Are they a very small city? Very small. Okay. There's a lot of people that's running that can fund the entire city. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Sharp, Sharpsburg, if you look at their revenues, 
and their expenditures. And remember, these are only the governmental funds, which means in this particular diagnostic, there are no utilities included if they have one. Um, and you will see that 50% or more of their revenue is coming from one place because of that revenue source um, negative that they have right there. And we'll take a look at the revenues in a second. The reason that personal services number is in there, when the economy ever does a downturn, if a local government has more than 60% of their operating expenditures being paid for people, it's really tough for them to cut expenditures. So that is why that diagnostic is actually in there. And there, of course, we already talked about the reason the debt rising diagnostic is in there. In their particular case, they don't have any debt. So uh, Sharpsburg doesn't have any debt. <laughs> now we're going to take Sharp, uh, Sharpsburg because we're only looking at fiscal diagnostics and we're going to take a look at Swainsboro. And these are compared to statewide averages, which means they get every, this statewide average will be only cities, not county, not. Now when you start to look though, those taxes incorporate a lot of different categories. It includes the sales and use, the property, the selective sales and use is very high in Sharpsburg as opposed to um, the statewide average. If you take a look. It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Notes. 
because if you zero in on that short-term debt, those are normally that they've borrowed money against their tax collections. Normally, not always. Um, so that's an important um, a bit of information to come with. And again, we're still looking at 2003 because we haven't changed it to any other day. And if you want to go inside TED, you can average the period of time as well. So if you want to look at a five-year period or a four-year period, it will average those 40. Any other questions? Um, I just wanted to really be able to give you resources. TED is a resource for you. Now all cities and counties, their audits can be found on the Department of Audits website in PDF format. So uh, any city or county, their audits are always there. If, if they don't have an audit, their agreed upon procedures aren't there, but they are there. Any other questions that I can answer? Any questions? Sabrina, I don't see any. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our last presentation will be by Dr. Jim Ledbetter, his former director of the Institute. That's right. I'm kind of going to take about two minutes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in talking with Chairman O'Neill as part of our legislative services grant, we uh, agreed to do some work with you. I think this may be in your package. Yeah. This is sort of a work plan that we've outlined using this TED data uh, to analyze revenues uh, over this 18-year period and look at it to see the extent to which... Jim, if you don't mind, so that you face it on. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, to look at revenues over this 18-year period to determine the extent to which cities or counties are utilizing their own resources that are available, to see if there are any patterns based on size, geography, cities that, that have utilities or enterprise, or those who don't. Uh, uh, and and I thought I would like to invite you to do is to go to this TED website and look at the data. And then on your handout, Sabrina and I have our email addresses. And if you would like for us to look at other things, suggest other things to look at, drop us an email. Uh, and, and we'll see how we can put that into the work plan. Let me, let me hasten to add that there's a, there's a limit to what we can do. Uh, uh, we can't collect any new data. It's only the data that's included in the TED website. Uh, but, but I think, uh, Representative Martin, your question about drawing some correlation between the economy uh, and corporate and individual, and uh, uh, that, that would be a question that would be pretty easily answered by doing the correlation. Uh, and so we could answer a question like that for you. So, uh, uh, I look forward to hearing from you, and I think uh, uh, this work plan would have us doing this work and giving you a report uh, sometime in late October or early November. Be happy to respond to any questions. Any Chairman. questions for Dr. Ledbetter? Thank you, sir. Thank you. That concludes our meeting today. I have a um, we're going we have a reception that will be starting soon right next door. Uh, the room today and the reception has been sponsored by Georgia Power. Uh, they have one representative here and had two others, and they asked not to be named for some reason. But anyway, Georgia Power has furnished our meeting room today. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and and. <laughs> And, and we'll sponsor the reception that should start immediately. Uh, after the reception, some, some of you have uh, made reservations for dinner. We're going out to a place called Covey Rides. It's a brand new hunting preserve, beautiful on the Flint River. Uh, if you don't have driving instructions, Ward Lamb has driving instructions for it. Uh, for all the legislators, I've been told 
by the Director of Economic Development and the Camilla Chamber that there's a care package behind the bar for each of you. So I'll make sure you pick that up. The bar is dry, by the way. But uh, does anyone of the, the Senate or House have any comments? Uh, uh, Chairman O'Neill, I know you may want to mention the future meetings. Uh, yeah, where was that list? Did you have more of you in hand to me? I have a list in your list of time. Do you have another copy of that? Wow. What? 27th. 27th. The next meeting is going to be July 27th. It's going to commence at what time of day? 10 o'clock. 10 to 3 right now. 10 to 3 in the morning. It's going to be in. Uh, Will you tell us the rest of the time? Well, the next meeting will be on collectability from 10 to 3 in Marietta Southern Polytechnic Institute. It'll be 10 to 3 and we'll go to the lunch break. When is, when? What day? Oh, July Thursday, 27th. July the 27th. And that's in Cobb County, right? That's You're going to get directions out to everybody that uh, wants to come. Right. And I, I just close by wanting to thank uh, Representative Royal, Chairman Royal, for all the hard work and, and his uh, his folks down here. You all have been uh, outstanding hosts for our committee. I, I can certainly say for myself it's been a very <clears throat> learned experience for me. Uh, and as we build on uh, build on the body of knowledge here that, uh, that we've had such a good start going, I, I hope it's uh, going to be beneficial to uh, to all that uh, all the people we represent. So. I just want to say again, thank you very much. Thank it's you. been a great meeting. We appreciate all your participation. <laughs>